for your attention. Okay, great. Thank you, Tom, for covering those logistical details. Um, okay, and now it is time for our first presentation. And so it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Cameron Wake. Uh, Dr. Cameron Wake is the research professor at the is a research professor at the Institute for the Study of Earth, Oceans, and Space at UNH, and is the Josephine A. Lamprey Professor in Climate and Sustainability at the UNH Sustainability Institute. Cameron leads a research program investigating regional climate change through the analysis of ice core records and instrumental data. In addition, he holds down a significant teaching load and leads a, a regional collaborative efforts to build resilient low carbon communities. So Cam, please unmute yourself and start your presentation. All right, well, uh, thank you, Phil. I hope everybody can hear me okay. It's um, great to be with uh, you this morning, and I'd just like to start by thanking the whole uh, DES team for, uh, for setting up this uh, webinar and training and for inviting me to speak, and I thank all of you. It looks like 95 of you out there for, for attending. I think it's gonna be an interesting uh, morning. So as, uh, as Phil has already mentioned, uh, a couple of years ago, we actually uh, uh, pulled together um, organized by primarily by New Hampshire DES, an update to our New Hampshire Coastal Flood Risk Summary. And, and that report uh, was presented in two parts, and the science is the part I'm going to talk about today, and then Natalie Morrison uh, this afternoon will be talking about the guidance, which is how you might apply that science to uh, various types of projects. So I just wanted to provide you with a um, uh, next slide uh, with a little background, is that this whole process initially got uh, started back when uh, the New Hampshire Coastal Risks and Hazards Commission actually met for, I think it was three years, 2014 through 2016, and came up with a report on preparing New Hampshire for projected storm surge, sea level rise, and extreme precipitation. As part of that effort and at that time, uh, they created a science and technical advisory panel, uh, which I served on, which then produced a report on essentially looking at sea level rise, storm surge, and extreme precipitation in coastal New Hampshire. And then uh, they passed an RSA that essentially uh, requested that that report be updated every five years. And I just wanna say this was, uh, this was unanimously accepted by everybody who served on the commission, in part because we really want to ensure that our response is tied to what the latest science is. And so what you're hearing today is essentially an update of that initial report that came out in 2014, and our report was, uh, was uh, published in 2019. Next slide. Um, uh, it was, uh, oh, so uh, what I wanna do before I talk about the report actually is just uh, share, uh, start the morning with a little video. It's about a six minute video that essentially introduces uh, the science report. Then I'll come back in and talk about, uh, provide details to those various five sections that we're gonna talk about. But you can sort of sit back and, and watch this video and an extra gold star if you can identify who the narrator is.
after that one. I hope you all enjoyed that little video. I, uh, I, I find it a, it's a very good introduction to sort of the, the main findings. Um, I did want to provide a little bit of background on this report and to emphasize that it, it wasn't just an effort by a group of scientists, although you can see the lead, uh, lead authors and science advisors up there. Um, uh, and, and we did the bulk of the, the research and the writing. It was really a much broader group, group effort. We met for over a year. Um, it seems like actually a world away where we got together in big groups and talked about this report, given that we haven't really been able to do that at all over the past year. I'd just like to highlight that we had a set of, of really uh, well-respected external scientific reviewers on this. Who, who reviewed it in detail and provided us with hundreds of, of uh, comments and edits that we responded to that really improved the quality of the report. We had a very broad steering committee and we had uh, an even bigger group of technical advisors and adaptation practitioners. And uh, I should also emphasize that the project was really shepherded uh, really wonderfully, both by Kirsten Howard and, and Natalie Morrison. So this really was a broad team effort and it was really an honor to be able to help uh, lead at least uh, one of the, the products that we developed. Next slide. So as you heard from the video, there's really five sections in this report. We talk about sea level rise, coastal storms, groundwater rise, precipitation and freshwater flooding. And we look at sort of how these have changed in the past and how they might change in the future. And my presentation is just gonna follow these, uh, these five uh, sections. Uh, and I'm going to keep coming back to this slide in, in the key findings. This was something Natalie really encouraged us to do, was to really summarize what is really important about this up front. So you'll see this at the front part of the report. So uh, you've already heard on the sea level rise front, we know that relative sea level rise in New Hampshire is rising, and we've seen a rise of about seven and a half to eight inches over the last century. We also know that the, that the, the uh, rate of melting in the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheets is accelerating and that land ice is now the primary contributor to sea level rise and that's actually a major contributor to uncertainties in how much sea level is going to rise in the future and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And uh, uh, th this third point I think is, is really essential for everybody to understand is that um, uh, we do not see sea level rise flattening out for a long time. So sea level in coastal New Hampshire and indeed around the globe is going to rise for centuries. Um, and so uh, while this uh, is, is, uh, might be considered a slow moving uh, storm right now, it's going to be with us for a long, long time. And we are, we are not going to be able to ignore this. We need to uh, prepare for this. Uh, it's not something that levels off at 2100. We've, we've likely already crossed that, that tipping point. All right, next slide. I'll go into these in a little bit more detail. I just wanted to share, these are some NASA images. Uh, we're, we're, we're much better able to track the mass changes in Greenland and Antarctic ice sheet because of a satellite called GRACE, which measures changes in gravity as a result of mass loss. And here what you're seeing is, um, uh, the mass loss from Greenland, those really deep red areas on the, on the southern part of Greenland are where uh, really large uh, sort of uh, dis, um, uh, uh, glaciers are draining the Greenland ice sheet and, and flowing out as big ice shelves into the ocean. And it's really um, uh, those, uh, uh, those uh, ice streams that are really resulting in the, the decrease in the mass of the Greenland ice sheet. And you can see, uh, we're, uh, on average, we're losing 281 gigatons of, of mass from Greenland per year. So that's a billion tons of ice. So that's, um, that's pretty hard to, to, to figure, right? It's a really big number. Uh, a couple of analogies I use is one gigaton of ice is the equivalent to 400,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Also hard to fathom. But if you took a block of ice in Washington, D.C. that extended from the Capitol building to the Lincoln Memorial that was as wide as the mall and three times as high as the Washington Monument, that would be one gigaton of ice. And we're losing 281 gigatons of ice per year on average from Greenland, which is raising sea level by about two thirds of a millimeter per year. Next slide. Um, and so the same thing is happening uh, in Antarctica, and you can see here it's really Antarctica sort of split in, in two. We've got West Antarctica to the left and East Antarctica to the right, 
and the main area for concern in West Antarctica is all of the glaciers and, and ice shelves uh, down in, in that red area. And so we, we are not losing as much mass uh, from Antarctica right now, but the expectation is that that rate will increase. Again, because of the particular dynamics of ice shelves that float out onto the ocean, they're not only warmed by the atmosphere, but they're also being warmed by slightly warmer water underneath that's eroding those ice shelves. And when those ice shelves are, are, are removed, essentially um, uh, the ice behind that flows much more rapidly. So you can think about those ice shelves as being a cork in a wine bottle uh, that's, that's held horizontally. You pull out the cork, the water comes out. When you pull out those ice shelves, the ice is, is uh, flowing more rapidly in the ocean. And there's, uh, it's, we've never really seen disintegrations of ice sheets uh, of this magnitude. I mean, they've happened before, but we haven't had scientific instrumentations. They happen sort of from 20,000 to 10,000 years ago. And so there's uncertainty uh, actually in how quickly this proceeds, although many glaciologists feel that it is inevitable that big portions of Greenland and West Antarctica are actually going to end up in the ocean over the course of the next centuries. And that's going to be the main driver of sea level rise. Next slide. Uh, so how has sea level changed? Uh, again, this is uh, measurements from satellites starting in 1993. The black line here uh, represents the observed as sea level rise. And then down here, you see the components of that. Sea level has been rising because of uh, thermal expansion. So warm water uh, is less dense. It takes up more space. And so as it warms, as the ocean warms, uh, the, the water increases. And then the blue line represents added water to the ocean, which is coming primarily from the melting of, um, of uh, glaciers and ice sheets and transferring that water from the land into the oceans. And then if you add those two up, you get the purple line. So you can see that our understanding of changes in the system is actually pretty good. Um, uh, next slide. Uh, and you, you can see that sort of we've seen since 1993, we've seen uh, sea levels go up by almost four inches globally. Next slide. Thank you. So in terms of uh, looking at future uh, uh, sea level rise, we actually decided to take a probabilistic approach uh, based on the research that Bob Kopp from Rutgers has actually presented. And what, and what he does is looks at uh, uh, all the different processes that drive relative sea level rise at specific locations. So we focused a lot on relative sea level rise because that's what we are going to experience at the coast of New Hampshire. So I've talked about how the ice sheets contribute to that. I've talked about how glaciers contribute to that. We've got thermal expansion. There's also oceanic processes that affect our sea level rise. Uh, and so as we have changes in the Gulf Stream, uh, we're gonna have uh, changes in the flow of the Gulf Stream. We're gonna have changes in sea level rise here. And the way I've heard it explained is uh, it's, uh, the, the Gulf Stream appears to be slowing down. And as it slows down, it kind of flattens out a little bit. And as it flattens out, that affects sea level on, uh, on much of the east coast of the US. Uh, changes in Earth's gravitational field, specifically by the melting of glaciers uh, or these big ice sheets, actually is affecting sea level rise. So, so sea levels are sort of higher close to Greenland and Antarctica because of that mass. As that mass uh, reduces, uh, it, uh, local sea level uh, around those ice masses decreases, while in other areas it increases. And then uh, changes in land water storage uh, as a result of dams or pumping water for groundwater or other processes can affect relative sea level rise. And then there's these local uh, non-climatic sea level rise changes due to glacial, glacial isostatic adjustment uh, important here. So our coast is relatively stable. It continues to sink a little bit. It's a much bigger problem south of here uh, where that their coast is sinking at about the same uh, rate that global sea levels are rising. So you, you hear about this in, in Maryland all the way down to South Carolina is that relative sea level rise is greater there because the coast is sinking. So we considered all of these and actually developed probability distribution functions for all of these to estimate uh, probabilities on different sea level rise projections. Next slide. I should also emphasize that we, we, we did these for different global emission scenarios. And so uh, in the report, we have the results for uh, different global emission scenarios. But the one I'm showing you here is for RCP 4.5, which essentially is a scenario that emissions continue to rise to the middle of the century and then flatten out, resulting in about sort of uh, two and a half degrees centigrade, let's say four degrees uh, Fahrenheit temperature rise. So this is a middle of the road uh, scenario. 
So in that sense, it does not represent the worst case scenario. It represents if we really decide to get our act together and, and reduce our emissions and invest in energy efficiency. And so uh, what you, see, you can see here is the historical data, um, uh, uh, both from Portland and from CV Island in the, in the Piscataqua River. And then uh, uh, sort of post um, 20, uh, 2016, 2015, uh, you see these increases. And so you can see uh, by 2050 uh, in the blue here, uh, that's the likely range, right? So the likely range there is there's a, sort of a 67% probability this will happen. We're going to see sea level rise on the order of 0 0.5 to 1.3 feet. Um, uh, uh, although there is a chance, right? If you look at like the 1 in 20 chance, it could be higher than that. And then if you go out to 2100, you can see uh, that uh, with the black circle there, you can see that sea level, uh, we project sea level to rise sort of 1.0 to almost three feet in the likely range. But again, when you look at lower probabilities, uh, there's a one in 20 chance that it'll be close to four feet. There's a one in 100 chance it would be greater than uh, five feet. And there's a one in 1000 chance that it might be eight feet. So uh, why did we do these probabilities? Well, what's important is that, as Natalie is going to talk about, is that uh, you can look at these probabilities in terms of what your risk tolerance is. And she'll talk more about that. But what I'd like to emphasize, if you don't think the one in 1,000 chance is possible, well, I would just have you take a look at what's happening in Texas right now. They designed their electrical grid, and they never envisioned the event that is happening right now in terms of the really cold temperatures and the freezing of natural gas in the, in the, in the pipelines so that it can't, they can't run their plants. So uh, that's less than a one in 1,000 chance uh, event that is actually spelling out and it's resulting in you know, tragic death and misery, tragic death for dozens of people and misery for millions of people. Um, so uh, th these, the probabilities we think is a very sound way uh, to approach this. Next slide. Um, and then in, I, I'm not going to go through this in, in detail, but in the report we have sort of all of those numbers spelled out in considerable detail in tables that we hope are, are really straightforward to read and, and color-coded. So if you want more information, uh, please feel free to uh, reference those. Next slide. Um, uh, just a, a, uh, a looking back uh, at how well our projections actually are reaching reality. So the colored lines here represent our, our projections. You see the blue lines uh, in the um, uh, present the, the likely range and then the 5% probability. And I've plotted in black the Portland, Maine uh, tide gauge record annual data up through 2020. And you can see that the, the tide gauge is showing sort of on average as identified by that black dashed line. Uh, that we are sort of right in uh, the 50% the probability range. That doesn't mean that's what's going to continue in the future, but it does mean that, you know, in the short term, our, our estimates are pretty good, which is what you expect, uh, is that uh, closer to the current day, uh, we have more certainty in our results. Next slide. All right, so moving on to uh, the coastal storms, um, you know, the, key, uh, the key findings, uh, right, Inland and coastal impacts from storm surge in coastal New Hampshire are going to increase with relative sea level rise just because sea level rise, relative sea level rise is going to be higher. Uh, we also expect that uh, future storm surge increases as storm intensity increases. Um, and the current 100-year uh, return period, uh, there is some variability in that. There's different ways to do that analysis. But right now, it's currently around 4.4 to 5.3 feet. That's what our best estimates of what our, our storm surge are. So, all right, next slide. Um, so one of the big issues and one of the questions that, that science is, is challenged to answer uh, is, are hurricanes going to be more frequent or stronger in the future? And the best research uh, basically, basically indicates that we, might, we probably won't see more hurricanes, but the hurricanes we see are likely to be stronger in no small part because there's more energy in the ocean because of warmer sea surface temperatures. So we've been lucky, we haven't been hit by a big hurricane, right? Uh, New York uh, and New Jersey have not been so lucky. Uh, but uh, so we're gonna talk about results of what's gonna happen sort of uh, with current storms, but we expect that storms in the future are going to be stronger. Next slide. Um, 
Uh, this is that, that return estimate that I just mentioned. So the latest analysis done by Tom uh, Littman really suggests that the 100-year the stor the storm surge here is really greater than five feet. So his estimates are 5.3 feet at the mouth of the harbor, and that's a little bit higher than previous estimates. But sort of four and a half to 5.3 feet is a, is a pretty good range uh, to consider. Next slide. Um, there's a lot of, of data here, uh, and I, I want to go through it a little bit because this is really important. And again, this comes from some, some detailed oceanographic and tidal modeling that Tom Littman and his colleagues have done. Um, what you're looking at is flow and ebb currents and those changes with sea level rise and storm surge. So if we just look up here at the, at the Great Bay example, you can see the top two lines are the average flood and the average ebb, and then the, the bottom ones are maximum flood and maximum ebb. So what you're looking at is uh, the fractional increase in the currents associated with ebb and tide. So if we just look at the, the maximum flood under 6.3 feet of, sea level, of relative sea level rise, which right, could happen by the end of the century, you're looking at an increase of 26 to 32 percent on the, on the currents. If you add that to, uh, sorry, uh, if you look just at the 100-year storm, you can see that those ebb and tide currents uh, increase by 40 to 50 percent. And if you combine both sea level rise and the storm surge, you can see that there's an increase in those currents on the order of 61 to 97 percent. Why is this important? Because when we put infrastructure in the ocean, we want it to last for a long time. So if we think about bridge abutments or piers, uh, that we expect there to be more currents on those piers, uh, on, the, on that infrastructure in the future. Um, both associated with sea level rise and with 100-year storms and certainly with both. So this is really something to start considering as we think about transportation infrastructure uh, in the water. Um, and you can see uh, sort of the main points, right, the, 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 the box down at the bottom there, that second point, flood and ebb tidal currents will increase under sea level rise, even without storm, storm surge, and then they'll increase more with storm surge, and there's important consequences for uh, loading on structures. Next slide. All right, uh, groundwater rise. Uh, two main points coming here is that uh, coastal groundwater levels are going, sorry, three main points. Coastal groundwater levels are going to rise with relative sea level. The amount of, ground the amount of groundwater rise uh, is, going to, um, uh, is going to be uh, greatest at the coast and it's going to decrease inland, but it's going to, to go much further inland than we might expect sort of tidal flooding or even storm surge flooding to occur. And I'll show that. Um, and that uh, this is really a, a quite a heterogeneous system. So there's quite a lot of spatial variability in how much, uh, uh, how far inland uh, that will uh, relative um, groundwater rise will occur uh, in no small parts or related to coastal geometry and geology and then the fr fr proximity of freshwater discharge areas and wetlands. Next slide. Um, uh, I'm going to sort of skip over, to just do this really briefly, but there's many ways that, that sea level rise is going to affect uh, groundwater, it's going to affect relative, sea, uh, uh, relative groundwater rise, it's going to affect potentially septic systems, it's going to affect uh, infrastructure, groundwater discharge to streams, and, and the landward movement of the freshwater uh, saltwater interface, so affecting groundwater uh, supplies as well. Next slide. Uh, so this is a, is a map that um, Jane Nott and her colleagues have produced that really has, it, it shows a really, it's a really nice way to envision this challenge is that it's the groundwater rise as a percentage of sea level rise. So it really helps highlight areas that are vulnerable. And you can see sort of two big bulges, right? One around the Hampton Seabrook estuary, uh, and then another one around sort of between the Gulf of Maine and Great Bay. And you can see that the, the impact of groundwater rise can extend several miles inland, right? Three miles, um, uh, four miles, if you look at sort of Great Bay, right, quite far inland. And so again, this is gonna have impacts on a whole uh, uh, variety of, of uh, entities from our, our, our wetlands uh, to increase discharge to rivers, as well as to our infrastructure as that groundwater gets lifted, right? You can think about septic infrastructure or roadway infrastructure that's going to be uh, affected by this. Next slide. Um, uh, this is a plot that's kind of difficult to see. I just wanted to highlight because it shows that the, the amount of groundwater rise is uh, relatively variable as you go inland. Um, 
uh, but it's 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 going to be more uh, at the coast and it's going to decrease as you go inland. Next slide. Uh, so we're on to the fourth section here, changes in precipitation, right? The key points here is that we've already seen an increase in, in, uh, in the magnitude of extreme uh, precipitation, actually, as well as the frequency in New Hampshire's coastal watershed, uh, and that signal is pretty strong. Um, we expect this to uh, continue to increase over the next uh, several decades, and the main reason here is that both we have a warmer atmosphere that can hold more water, and we have warmer sea surface temperatures, that uh, essentially uh, uh, support the enhanced evaporation of water. And then um, uh, the magnitude of flooding in the future as a result of this increased precipitation is gonna depend in part by how much that we build out our, our watersheds and how much impervious uh, material that we lay down on the ground. Next slide. So uh, one of the ways that we look at this is uh, how has the number of uh, four inch events over a course of 48 hours changed historically? And so here's the, the uh, five stations that are uh, within or close to uh, the coastal watershed. So you've got Durham, New Hampshire, Lawrence, Mass, Concord, New Hampshire, Sanford, Maine, and Epping. And you can see over this time period that the number of those events has increased with a you know, really big series of events in the 1990s, but also another big series of events in the 2000s, which resulted in some really extreme flooding in coastal New Hampshire. And that signal is consistent across the region and not as strong in Concord and stronger in, in the more coastal stations. So we've already seen this increase in extreme precipitation. Next slide. And so uh, overall, we are actually gonna continue, uh, actually I should explain this plot. So we've looked at how precipitation is going to increase uh, across the Northeast, and we specifically downscale this for this report to focus on the Great Bay watershed. And what we're seeing is that we are going to see uh, more precipitation overall, but again, more of that precipitation is going to come in, uh, in fewer events. And I think the big point I wanna make here is that we are going to have uh, freshwater resources, and it's time to start thinking about how we can preserve those because we don't see more precipitation coming in summer, but we do see it in fall, spring, uh, fall, winter, and spring. And more in spring is commonly where we have our, our flooding events. Next slide. I'll wrap up in the next minute or two. So one of the things we were able to do was project out, uh, again, for, uh, for Portsmouth and, and Durham and Concord, how we expect precipitation, these large precipitation events to change in the future. And you can see down there at the bottom in the blue circle, if you look at the two inches in 24 hours or the four inches in 48 hours, those bigger events that commonly lead to flooding across the region, uh, is that uh, we can see that there's uh, sort of in the near term, there's sort of 10 to 40% increase in these events. As you get out into the medium term, that, that's the middle column there, the two middle columns, we can see it's more on the range of 20 to 80%. And then by the end of the century, uh, we're looking more at sort of 30 to 125 percent of these events. Now it's really challenging to forecast out those specific events out in the future, but uh, the, the underlying uh, conclusion is really, is really quite solid and we have confidence in it, is that we can expect to see uh, more of these events in the future and we need to start preparing our infrastructure and to the extent we can our ecosystems. All right, next slide, I'll just uh, wrap up. Uh, so uh, freshwater flooding, uh, without going through uh, the slides, I'm running a little bit behind, so I'll really just focus on, on the main points here. Um, freshwater flooding has already increased uh, in New Hampshire in, in magnitude and frequency, and uh, it's really challenging to project out how flooding will increase in the future because it really depends on uh, what we call antecedent conditions, but really soil moisture. And so when does the rain come? in respect to what the soil moisture is. So if those big precipitation events were coming in summer, they wouldn't present as much of a risk for flooding as if they come in the spring when we have a significant snowpack or when the ground is frozen, or if we have a, a series of two events, we have drizzle for a week so that the soils are really wet and then we have a really big precipitation event. Uh, but all indications are that with increasing extreme precipitation events, we are in fact going to experience freshwater flooding. So uh, I'm just a minute over. Why don't I stop there and then I'll be happy to answer any questions that have come in while I've been talking. Great. Thank you, Cam. That was you know, a great presentation. Um, so again, um, 
If you have some, we have a few minutes. So if you have uh, questions, please use the questions um, box for the webinar um, and type them in there. So I, there's one there already. So I'm going to just read, get the ghost going on that one. And so Cam, the question is, uh, are the predictions for increased magnitude of storms more of a factor of rising sea level rise, or are there definitive atmospheric parameters separate from sea level rise that predict increasing magnitude rather than a predominance of increasing frequency? Uh, yes. So um, uh, uh, there's a lot to unpack there. Let me see if I can I can do that. So in terms of the increasing size of storms. That is uh, independent of, of sea level rise. So the, the sea level rise part of that is that those storms have more of an impact because there's higher relative sea level. Uh, but those uh, increase in, in the strength of storm, uh, storms is really coming out of the research that's being done on hurricanes. And uh, the indication is that with warmer uh, sea surface temperatures, not only in the Gulf of Mexico, but up sort of through uh, the east coast of the US, that th those storms have the opportunity to really um, increase their strength because of the evaporation of seawater, which is the it, which is the engine that drives uh, big hurricanes. It also seems uh, from the research that recently those storms have been increasing in intensity when they get very close to the coast. Again, warm seawater, but something that makes them actually a little bit more difficult to predict because there's that intensification right before they they hit the land. Uh, which is particularly troubling. And so those dynamics uh, of the way hurricanes are, are developed and then enhanced, uh, uh, we expect them to be stronger in a world warmed by greenhouse gases. So that's separate. And then uh, what, what the research doesn't show is that we expect more hurricanes to happen. However, a lot of the storms that we really have to deal with and the ones that we've dealt with primarily over the last several decades have been nor'easters. And there is some indication that, that the number of nor'easters might increase. However, I, I think uh, that there's, there's not a lot of confidence in that result. And I think we can just, you know, we get several nor'easters per year, and I think uh, we just have to deal with those. The real challenge around nor'easters is that they do tend to sort of influence us for two or three days. So we, 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 they, they hit us and they occur uh, sort of over uh, one or two or sometimes three high tide cycles. So that's a, a real challenge. Hope I answered that question. Great. Uh, yeah. So there, we, um, if you have any questions, please put them in. We have a minute more. Um, so Cam, while people are typing, I had one question on that. Um, so when we talk about storm surge levels, are, are those strictly from the ocean side, or is that a combination of um, higher levels in the ocean, water levels in the ocean, being met with flooding coming from the landward side? Uh, so th that's a fantastic question, uh, Phil, and I would say that um, the, the way that we define storm surge and FEMA defines storm surge is uh, uh, looking solely at uh, the storm surge in the ocean. So as the, the winds uh, whip up the water and the waves uh, uh, increases the elevation of the ocean, uh, especially as you get closer to the land and you have, uh, you have shallower waters. Um, and so uh, storm surge is most often defined as actually looking at how high the water levels have been for storms in the past. Um, what we tend not to do is uh, sort of have data or tide gauges where there is a lot of, uh, of, uh, of fresh water flowing into the system. So for example, not a lot of tide gauges up in, in Great Bay, although there, there has been one that's been put in there uh, recently. Uh, the, the second part of your question there is a really good one in that we have not really begun to uh, well, we, we've begun. We haven't. We we, we haven't done it. I, I would say really well in integrating the models of freshwater flooding combining with storm surge. So what are those impacts? So you can imagine sort of a storm surge wave uh, making it up into Great Bay if there was a big flood coming down the Oyster and the Lamprey River. Sort of what happens at that interface? How much sea level rise uh, would go up? I think that's a, that's an ongoing research question and one that has been asked by a number of people and there's there's some significant efforts to try and address that. I think at the very least we have to acknowledge that there's going to be some uh, some significant impacts as sea level rises um, and these extreme precipitation increases. But right now we we just we haven't been able to model it to quantify that. Uh, I hope that's something that we can address by the time that the, the next 
coastal flood risk report comes out. Okay, I know we're running a little over time. We have one more question, and I'll, I'm just going to get it out here um, while we have you here as such an expert. Um, how has AMOC slowed over your uh, slowed over your analysis period, and what impact does this have on New England flooding versus, let's say, Chesapeake flooding? Uh, I'm not sure what AMOC is. But do you know what that is? Uh, so uh, Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, mm -hmm. um, more popularly known as sort of the formation of North Atlantic deep water, but it's a it's essentially uh, the the Gulf Stream is the surface part of that, and as the Gulf Stream flows north, it loses its heat, it gets more dense, and ends up sinking and flowing down the Atlantic Ocean uh, down into the into the Southern Atlantic Ocean, and then picks up bottom water from Antarctica. And so what we've seen is as, uh, as the uh, North Atlantic uh, warms and freshens that that water is becoming less dense, it's not sinking as much. So the strength of Atlantic meridional overturning circulation is decreasing. And so uh, uh, in terms of the question, I don't know exactly how it's changed over our, our period of analysis if you think about the last few years. Over the last uh, 30 years, uh, there has been, um, uh, we, we think that there's been a significant decrease in the strength of that. It actually turns out it's really hard to measure and model. I mean, it's an enormous amount of water um, that we're talking about. Uh, but what's crystal clear is that the one, one of the two places on the earth that is cooling is around Iceland. Uh, and uh, what we expect is that cooling is being driven by a decrease in the energy that's transported northward with the Gulf Stream. And what that means for us, I, I mentioned just briefly at the beginning, is that as, that as the Gulf Stream slows a little bit, which again is the surface expression of AMOC, is that it's likely to spread out. And that spreading out is going to result in higher sea levels um, uh, in uh, across the East Coast. And I think you can see it manifested in that curve I showed from Portland is that we have these periods of two to three years when uh, the relevant the tides at in Portland are measured as much higher, like three to four inches higher in, in over a year or two, and then it drops back down again. So I can see it's it's being expressed in variability in uh, the tide gauge data in Portland. Great. Okay. I think we have to end it there. Uh, Cam, it was a fascinating presentation and great answers. Um, I wish we were in a big room where we could all give a thundering round of applause. <laughs> uh, um, and you know, I checked earlier today, and there are no emojis that we can turn on to show you know a virtual applause. But I, I think I speak for everyone in saying a great presentation and many, many thanks for sharing your um, your deep knowledge on this topic. My pleasure, Phil, and looking forward to the, the presentations to come. Okay, great. Um, so let's move on to our next presentation. Um, and so it is my uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. Jennifer Jacobs. Uh, Jennifer Jacobs is a professor uh, in the Department of uh, Civil Engineering at UNH. Uh, Jennifer is a water resources engineer and a surface water hydrologist with expertise in rainfall, floods, snow, and their impact on infrastructure. Uh, she is the principal investigator on an NSF grant to study infrastructure, uh, the NSF Infrastructure and Climate Network Project, and the chapter lead on the fourth National Climate Assessment Transportation Chapter. Uh, Jennifer will be presenting on the impacts of climate change projections on coastal transportation nationally and in coastal New Hampshire, and she'll provide results on, the, on a study on the impacts of coastal flooding on transportation, transportation delay, sorry, flooding in, on Sorry, excuse me. The impacts of trans of coastal flooding on transportation, traffic delays, and pavement integrity due to groundwater rise. Uh, so Jennifer, please unmute yourself and begin your presentation. Great. Thanks so much, Phil, for the introduction. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Great. Uh, so, and also thanks to Kirsten and the rest of the uh, New Hampshire DES team for, for pulling together this workshop. This is a great opportunity to hear lots of different pieces of what's happening in, in our region. Uh, so, as Phil said, I'm going to be focusing on transportation infrastructure. Uh, Cameron did a fantastic job of setting up what's happening from the climate stressor side. And now I'm going to provide just a little bit more granularity on it. As Phil also mentioned, I wear a lot of different hats, and so I'm going to bring in some of those different bits and pieces in order to be able to give everyone that's listening 
a context both nationally as well as locally about what's happening about the impacts from climate stressors on some of our transportation infrastructure. Next, please. If you are sitting in, uh, next slide, please. There we go. If you're sitting in your agency, chances are you think about those climate stresses, you think about the things that Cameron was talking about in a way that's really centric to things that matter to you. For me, when I see the disasters that are happening, whether they're recent disasters or disasters that are happening right now, I oftentimes focus on the fact that most of the pictures that we see have roads in them. And those roads have got people connected to them, they've got communities. And as soon as you interrupt the transportation system by some of these climate stressors, you're impacting those communities, those people's, and people in the economy. Uh, we're seeing it right now down in Texas. Uh, there's just a huge challenge with supply chains being broken up by the, the changing winters. So we're going to focus on, on that context. Uh, we'll start with a mile high view. Um, next, next slide. And we've been we've been thinking about this at, at a national level for well over a decade. Started early on in the uh, 2010 or so when we started feeling a lot more climate stressors hitting our coastlines. Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Irene really got us going and thinking about what are the challenges from those on our coastal regions from hurricane stressors on our transportation infrastructure. And Federal Highway, the Federal Highway Administration at the national level was really leading the way and was instrumental in getting us going and thinking about those challenges and how, how vulnerable our coastlines are. And so moving forward, uh, the challenges weren't just on the coastline. It became really clear that inland stressors were also uh, problematic, that particularly in flooding. So flooding, whether it was Vermont, Colorado, uh, Midwestern regions, flooding has really been a challenge. It's been one that's been accelerating. And so we moved on and started thinking more about not just coastal areas, but also flooding. Uh, the stressors and the number, the uh, challenges are, are not limited to, to flooding or to the coastal sea level rise. And so we're trying to get all the different bits and pieces together. Uh, at this point in time, there, we've moved from just looking at our vulnerability and starting to really think about resiliency and how specifically do we meet some of the challenges. And I think that's one of the challenges for our, our state is how do we take the information that the, uh, that the crew that developed the, um, uh, developed the New Hampshire coastal flood risk and uh, coastal flood risk summary data set, how did they, uh, how do we take that information and move that forward and make our communities uh, more resilient? Uh, as we move forward, I think we're, it's going to be all about resiliency. How do we make choices both at a state level as well as at, as well as at a community level? And clearly, it, New Hampshire's small. We've got to all be talking to each other. Next slide, please. In my hat as uh, serving as a chapter lead on, for the National Climate Assessment, I had a chance to look across the nation and to think about what some of the challenges are. And so the fourth National Climate Assessment, if you haven't had a chance to take a look at it, do pull it out there. Uh, chapter 12 is the chapter on transportation, but there's also a chapter that is on the Northeast region that really does a great job of, of saying what's, what's happening, uh, both nationally at the, for the transportation sector, but regionally for the Northeast region. Uh, there are three key messages that came out of the transportation chapter. The first one is that clearly our transportation infrastructure are, are at risk from climate change. And what we've said was that a reliable, safe, an efficient U.S. transportation system is at risk from increases in heavy precipitation, coastal flooding, heat, wildfires, and other extreme events, as well as changes to the average temperature. Throughout this century, climate change will continue to pose a risk to U.S. transportation infrastructure with regional differences. And the graphic that we have on the right-hand side shows these stressors and also the different types of transportation infrastructure that are being challenged by these. And when I look at this graphic, I really kind of would like to go down in that arrow and say, you know, it's not about that particular bridge or it's not about that particular uh, section of roadway. What it is, it's about how our transportation system performs. And it's those performance goals that the State Departments of Transportation are uh, required to meet that are under stress because of climate change stressors on the particular infrastructure assets. Next slide, please. The second key message was that, again, this is not about impacts to particular assets necessarily, that it's about the entire urban and rural transportation system. 
And so that second key message said that extreme events that increasingly impact the transportation network are inducing societal and economic consequences, some of which disproportionately affect vulnerable populations. And clearly we're seeing that down in, in Texas right now. In the absence of intervention, future changes in climate will lead to increasing transportation challenges, particularly because of the system complexity, aging infrastructure, and dependency across sectors. And those of you that work in the transportation agency or any infrastructure agency realize that much of our infrastructure is an aging infrastructure. And so the challenges and the stressors are pushing on an already vulnerable, an already vulnerable infrastructure. The image that I pulled on, on the right-hand side uh, is shown in, in Hampton. And with this image, it's, it's clear that it's not just the road, it's not just the car, but it's also the people that depend upon those. The third, the third message, next slide, please. The third message gets to what have we done so far? And that is vulnerability assessments. And so when we put together this chapter back in 2018, what we found was that uh, engineers, planners, and researchers in the transportation field are already showing increasing interest and sophistication in understanding the risks that climate hazards pose to transportation assets and services. So we understand what's at risk. And the transportation practitioner efforts demonstrate the connection between advanced assessment and the implementation of adaptation measures. Though many communities still face challenges and barriers to action. And I think that's really where we are today, is that we have an understanding of what, what infrastructure is at risk. And we're trying to figure out what do we need to do specifically? And how do we do that in a way that is policy relevant, that is relevant to the communities and works within the community's culture and the community's needs. Next slide, please. So bringing it down, making it a little bit more local. Uh, in the New England area and in New Hampshire, uh, we've been also at this for about a decade. And so uh, one of the things, one of the resources that we have across the Northeast and across uh, in particular New Hampshire is the Infrastructure and Climate Network. And this is a network that I founded uh, with a number of my colleagues, including Cam Wake, uh, and working with to develop a collaborative network of over 100 climate science, social science, and transportation practitioners and academics in the Northeast. And ICNet has been dedicated to accelerating the resilience of transportation system uh, to climate change since over for over the past decade. And Really what we were doing was we were starting back in 2012, trying to bring together two communities that hadn't talked to each other, the transportation researchers and practitioners, all the state departments of transportation across the Northeast region with climate, climate science experts and really having them communicate and understand what's happening. Uh, next, please. So in New Hampshire, uh, we've had, let's pop one back up. Uh, in New Hampshire, We've got a list of names there. I'm going to hit a couple of folks that have just been involved in the infrastructure and climate network, as other as well as other initiatives with climate change. Uh, a few folks that have been involved since the get-go, where Ann Schultz has really taken a leadership role, fantastic uh, leader in climate change and infrastructure. Uh, Bob Landry, who has since retired, and Jennifer Resnick, who's taken over his work. Uh, and Kevin Russell, who used to serve in the region that uh, covers the New Hampshire seacoast area, has also been, uh, been involved. So there's a lot of resources, a lot of capability within New Hampshire, in particular within the State Department of Transportation. Next slide, please. Back in 2011, it was, uh, we were rebounding from Hurricane Irene, and that hit us hard in Vermont, hit us hard in the New Hampshire in the mountains area bridges and roads taken out around the, around the Loon area. And one of the questions that we asked the State Department's and leads in the State Department's of Transportation was, what keeps you up at night? And next. And so the answer was, and it's really the same answer that we're seeing now, is flooding was the big one. It came to mind in, in a number of different ways. Uh, but also winter maintenance, frost haze potholes. And then the last one on there that you can see in orange at the top is the tidal flooding. So sea level rise and some of the challenges there were also were also coming to mind. So those are kind of the big three as we look across the across the uh, state and across the region: flooding, changing winters, and the uh, and the sea level rise. Next, please. 
So what we did as a community is we started pushing on some of these and trying to get a better understanding of what's happening, what those challenges are, and how do we respond to those. And so I'm going to hit a few of those. Uh, the first one that I think we kind of missed the boat on a little bit in NCA4 uh, was that we didn't really push on the changing winters and the polar vortex and the effects that we're seeing all across the mid part of the country, all the way down into Texas, is really a, a precursor and challenge to that winter is getting it's getting weirder and it's getting different. And if you're as old as I am and have been around New Hampshire as long as I've been, you know that things are changing. You've seen it. Uh, but clearly what we're seeing is that our winters are getting shorter. Our shoulder seasons are kind of pushing in. We have less snow, uh, but it's not always that way every single year. One of the challenges that we have, next slide, is that we have less winter con continuous. We've got more freeze-thaw cycles, meaning it warms up, it cools down, it warms up, it cools down. For those of us in transportation, that means potholes and frost heaps, real problems and challenges to our roadways. The other thing is that less of our snow is coming down as snow itself, and more of it's coming down as frozen, as freezing rain, sleet, uh, some sort of ice. And if you are looking at trying to manage your roadways, uh, talk to anybody that's managing, managing a roadway, they'd rather have 12 inches of nice, like white fluffy stuff than to have the uh, sheets of ice that came down earlier this week. Uh, in that case, you're applying a lot more road salt in order to be able to manage, in order to be able to manage those roadways. And that road salt is starting to have implications as well. The additional road salt, uh, what we're starting to hear from the state departments of transportation is there, they have a well buyout program. And the well buyout program happens when if the well gets contaminated with road salt, um, so if a well is adjacent to a road that's heavily salted and it gets contaminated, um, that well may not be viable anymore, or the groundwater there may be might, might turn a little bit more saline. And so we're starting to see not only impacts on our roads during those events, but also long-term challenges from additional road salt needed to be able to maintain the safety of, those, of the, that infrastructure. Next, please. So biggie, flooding. Uh, and we have had uh, numerous flooding events. Uh, Cameron did a nice job of covering what's happening with our changing rainfall. Uh, image shown right here. Uh, when that changing rainfall occurs, when we see increased flooding, what we're going to see is we're going to see impacts to our roadway. So this was a, we had a fall 2017 storm that entirely buckled uh, Route 302 in Crawford Notch. Clearly, this is a road that is just um, hugely impacted. What we're doing around that, uh, next please, is we're starting to come up with specific design standards that take into account the changing precipitation regimes. It seems like only yesterday, but it's actually been a decade since we switched our design rainfall to take into account uh, to use the Cornell design standards rather than the TP40 standards for designing roadways. What's happening in the states around the region is that we're now coming up with, let's take some of those design standards, whether it's the Cornell data set or whether it's the new Atlas 14 design precipitation data set, and let's bump up those numbers by a bit. I'm showing a map of uh, New York State, and in New York State on the left hand, on the west side of New York State, they have one increase, and on the right hand side, they've got a slightly different increase. We're talking increases of 15 to 20 percent in design standards, but, it can't, but what that is doing is it's allowing us to account for what's going to happen, what's likely to happen in the future. Next slide, please. Now, flooding doesn't always happen inland. It's also happening in, in coastal roadways. And one of the challenges with, with the coastal roadways that you may not think about as much is the question of, well, when should a road be close to flooding? And clearly, if the water's high enough so that the, uh, the road, it's not passable, it should be close to flooding. And so we'll put the cones up and we'll put the barriers up. One of the things that we think a little bit less about is as the water starts to recede, when do we pull those cones off? And usually, people are trying to drive through as soon as they possibly can, uh, standing water not, uh, notwithstanding. So if the Jeep can get through that, it's going to give a shot. Uh, as soon as that road dries out and the water level drops below the surface, people want to use those roads. Next, please. And so some of the research that we've been doing, it's sort of a topic that probably you don't think that much about, but would make sense, is that as soon as your roadway gets wet and your base layers are entirely saturated, it's weaker. And if that roadway is weaker and we put a heavy vehicle on top of it, then what we're going to do is we're going to uh, damage, we can potentially damage that roadway. Now, coastal roadways are designed a little bit different and probably in, in many cases can handle 
those roadways. But here what we've got is we've got some challenges between deciding whether or not to open or to close a flooded roadway, in particular when to take those, those signs off. If we don't open it, we have uh, challenges because we're not letting the commerce through. If we do, if we do open it, we potentially damage the roads, roads and put the cost on the public. Next, please. And so, some of the some of what we've been doing is figuring out smart ways to be able to determine best practices for reopening up those roads. Next, please. So, getting back to getting back to our coastal area. Uh, Cameron did a wonderful job of setting this up. Clearly, New Hampshire's uh, sea level rise has risen, and we're anticipating that sea levels are going to rise, uh, it are going to be rising more in the future. And we've got some great data and great information about how we account for that. Uh, if we look at the graphic on the left, that's where that's where I start saying, okay, what does the sea level rise mean to our our coastal communities? And a lot of it is how do we maintain the roads in those coastal communities? After me, Julie LeBranch is going to be talking about some great work that the Rockingham Planning Camp, uh, Council is doing, the Commission is doing on the sea level rise and, and roads in our coastal regions. So next slide. So when we were talking with the Infrastructure and Climate Network, every every year that we came back, it seemed like we were talking about, first we talked about sea level rise, and we were talking about storm surge. And then the following year, we came back, we started talking about high tide flooding, which is the temporary inundation of low-lying areas during exceptionally high tide events. Uh, and then the following year, we came back and we just saw Cameron present some of the work that we had done on sea level rise to induce groundwater rise. And so when I look at what's happening in the coastal area from sea level rise, I think that there's really those four things that we all we need to be taking into account, not individually, but collectively. So next, please. So with the high tide flooding, uh, unfortunately also in New Hampshire, we have the New Hampshire Coastal Adaptation Working Group. This is a long-term established group that does a great job of bringing together the communities as well as the state agencies to think about what the challenges are from, from climate change for our coastal communities. And this is one image out of, a, out of a king tide contest. So clearly during these high tide events, what we're seeing is that our road, some of our roadways in the coastal areas are inundated. They're already being inundated and we're going to increasingly see that in the future. Next slide, please. And communities recognize this. This is an image out of the flood mitigation study that Hampton, New Hampshire Commission from uh, uh, Malone and uh, uh, Lone and McBroom back, and it was presented this past fall. Uh, and what they're starting to work on is they're recognizing areas that are flooding during this high tide flooding and trying to come up with solutions. Now, this is a single community, Hampton, doing the work. Next slide, please. Some of the other work that we did for the National Climate Assessment was we looked at these challenges with high tide flooding, and we said, this is not a Hampton problem. This is a problem that is happening throughout the entire East Coast into the Gulf Coast. And what I'm showing here is the number of vehicle hours of delay, just because if you're trying to get through a road, it's blocked from high tide flooding. And so you've got to go around that roadway in order to get to where you need to get to your work, your students, uh, your, your children's schools, uh, you need to get uh, delivery of goods and services. And what we're seeing is that there's already delays and that those delays are going to be increasing more and more so as we go into the future. And so one of the things we're trying to push at at a national level is not trying to have the communities handle this on a community by community basis, but have more additional resources from the federal, from federal agencies. Next slide, please. Cameron also hit a bit on the rising groundwater. And with the rising groundwater, what we know is that pavement life decreases when groundwater moves into the underlying layers and the increased temperatures also weaken the asphalt concrete. And so here what we're seeing is we're seeing the rise next. And if we see the temperature on top, we're weakening the top, we're weakening the bottom. Next and next, twice. And what that results in is impacts to the roadways. Fatigue, cracking, and rutting are things that can occur from the rising groundwater. Next. Cameron had showed this image of the groundwater rise zone. He did a great job explaining, but just to reiterate on this, what we're showing in colors here are the relative amount of groundwater rise as we extend as we extend inland. The dark blue is an area where we would expect overland flooding. The, the uh, other colors are areas where we would expect to see a rising groundwater. So rule of thumb on this, if sea level rise extends one inland, groundwater rise is going to extend about another four distance further inland. 
Next, please. And so when we talk about transportation and pavements, which pavements are likely to fail prematurely? We need two things. We need a rising groundwater and we need a groundwater that's already close to the surface. Next slide, please. If we look across and we map the New Hampshire seacoast, anywhere in red are going to be roads within the groundwater rise zone that have a groundwater table that's already very close to the surface. And that means that about a quarter of our region's roads are, are vulnerable to groundwater rise. Next slide, please. So what do we do about that? And this is where I think things are, things are uh, starting to move forward in really exciting ways. When and how do we make changes to our roadway that can protect against what's happening in the future? And so what this is doing, what this image is showing, is just when do we add additional hot mist asphalt uh, to that layer, to the roadways, in order to maintain the reliability of our system? Next slide, please. The other piece, I know we've got wetlands going on, wetlands that we're talking about here with the rising groundwater, is that in the coastal area, wetlands are a surface expression of the groundwater. And so if we expect to see rising, rising groundwater, we're also expecting to see that those wetlands are going to be expanding in areas. And so that expansion can be uh, relatively modest in the next decade or two, but really quite a bit by the, by the end of the century. Next, please. So I think the area that we're moving forward on is trying to manage that coastal infrastructure. And this is a great lead in for the work that Julie's going to be presenting. We've got a number of options. We can do nothing. We can avoid or keep out of the zones. We can try to accommodate the water that's coming in. We can try to resist it. And we can also think about relocating things that are in harm's way uh, and so this was a nice slide that was also presented from that Hampton study. So the engineering community is starting to think about these potential options. Next slide, please. At a federal level, we have a lot of uh, we have a number of guidance documents that are coming out. Uh, the first one on the left is on hydro hydrologic and hydraulic design of transportation infrastructure under climate change, and then the uh, next two are on uh, our federal highways hydraulic engineering circular for highways in the coastal environment. And then the one on the right-hand side is one that we should be paying attention to. And that's the nature-based solutions for coastal highway resilience and impl implementation guide. So these are very much hands-on, what are we as an engineering community, what tools do we have in order to be able to handle the changing climate? Next slide, please. So with that, I will thank the community of practice uh, the ICNET community has been an amazing group of people bringing together both the challenges as well as the realities of the, the world that they face and trying to move forward our coastal communities. So there's been a lot of work uh, for those of you that haven't been involved in ICNET that's already been done. So we've got a really very strong foundation to stand on in the state of New Hampshire for making our transportation infrastructure resilient. So thank you to my colleagues and uh, thank you for listening today. Uh, great, Jennifer. Uh, actually, Natalie, could you leave that? Uh, sorry, um, Stephanie, could you leave that slide up um, at the end of the presentation? Um, great presentation, and thank you so much for that. Um, I guess I I was just struck by, of course, you know how nice it would be to, for us all to be in a big room like that together, able to to talk in in person. Um, we have a few minutes now for questions. Um, if you have questions, please put them into the question box. Um, I had one that I wanted to ask just to get us started, which was, um, I just had a, you know, I, I appreciate you mentioning, you know, the connections to the wetlands uh, and the, the expansion of wetlands um, as a result of groundwater levels increasing. Um, could you talk briefly about, you know, the synergies that may exist between the uh, stream crossing uh, rules and the, for aquatic organism passage and geomorphology, uh, geomorphic stability? And their, the ability of those um, those you know, stream crossings to help with uh, increasing precipitation events. Right. So it's, it's been a, that's a great that's a great question. Uh, one of the upsides of the stream crossing rules, in addition to what they were meant to do, was that the a lot of the design practices that were put into place to handle aquatic organisms effectively made. It, uh, increase the capability to be able to handle some of those larger design storms. 
one of my colleagues, Charlie Hepson at New Hampshire DOT, took a specific look at that, uh, New Hampshire Maine DOT, took a specific look at that. And what he found was that by handling the aquatic organisms, we were effectively handling the expected increase in 15 to 20% of uh, additional flows. Great, yeah, thank you. Um, we have one one other question that's come in, and I'm sure there's others. So if there's time, please you know type them in. Um, and the question is, uh, do you believe that increased attention should be given to an east-west evacuation plan uh, as part of a 10-year plan? Uh, you know, I think this question is dealing with because of coastal flooding, uh, do we need to focus on the infrastructure that for the evacuation of seacoast areas due to whatever emergency? That's that's a great question. It's also a great lead-in for for Julie. Uh, as we think about, as we start mapping out which roads in our coastal area are vulnerable, I think what we need to be thinking about is how do we prioritize those roads? And what we'll what you'll see is that our coastal roads, as we start moving out towards some of the higher level scenarios, uh, our system entirely breaks down. And so as we prioritize some of those roads. Uh, so clearly, evacuation routes, access to uh, community resources, whether it's fire, hospitals, um, we need to be thinking very carefully about making certain that those, those roads are priorities. And we may be making some tough choices about which roads we uh, try to ensure are capable of handling, uh, handling the traffic and the transport needs. Uh, and it may, and so it's, it's going to, it's going to be a large challenge for us. But yes, I do think that uh, making certain that we handle the evacuation routes is a critical part of uh, of choices in which roads we we manage and which roads we think about. Excellent. Um, okay, another question has come in, and uh, the question is, uh, I think related to this issue of the cha changing winter winter weather. Um, are there considerations in hydrologic modeling to look at rain on snow or frozen ground events? So, you know, kind of this thing that we haven't dealt with, you know, in our earlier lives uh, where you have frozen ground and then heavy, heavy rainfall. Uh, how do we model those hydrologically? Ah, so it's a great question and one that's, that's near and dear to my heart. The short answer is we don't do that well right now. Uh, most of the design rainfall events are strictly based on uh, liquid precipitation. And so we're not thinking about what's happening in the winter time. I think we're starting as a hydrologic community to understand that that's more of a challenge. And so we're starting to push forward. Uh, one of the things that came out from my group recently is design standards for, uh, for precipitation and runoff that are based not only on precipitation, liquid precipitation, but also on snowmelt. And so I think then moving forward into uh, into the frozen ground and, and and those challenges, that's that's a natural next step. Uh, we also have the national water model that's starting to come out, and the community in NOAA is very much aware of some of the challenges with with frozen ground. And so hopefully in the national in the national models, those types of challenges will will rise to the top. If it's a challenge for the state, we should be verbal about that and let them know that that's important. And isn't the national water model um, being led by UNH? Uh, you know, I know that's a project to try and merge up this land-based flooding with uh, coastal flooding from the ocean side. I mean, isn't that um, someone at UNH is leading that effort? Uh, the national water model is being led by by NOAA. Uh, mm -hmm. There are there are specific modeling efforts that are in this in this region, uh, but I'm not aware of. Mm -hmm. uh, someone at UNH that's specifically uh, taking a leadership role in the national water model. Okay, all right, sorry. I... If, you, if you know someone that, that would be, it would be great to know that. Yeah, I just can't, I recall something and in, in, uh, perhaps someone from the coastal program who works with Naracuz could answer that question. Um, okay, well, we should move on. There, there are other pending questions, but uh, Jennifer, I wanna you know, give you a huge thank you for this uh, presentation. It was extremely helpful. And, and as I said with Cam, I really wish we could all give you a thunderous round of applause, but I'm sure everyone is uh, doing that at, at their own headsets. Um, and uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Bill.
Okay, so we should move on to our next presentation. We're just a few minutes behind, but that's okay. We'll, uh, we have a break coming up after this presentation, so we can um, use some of that time. And our next presenter is Julie LeBranch, and Julie is a senior planner with the Rockingham Planning Commission in Southeast New Hampshire. Her work in the region includes assisting communities with development of plans, zoning, or zoning ordinances and regulations relating to land use, natural resource protection, climate change, and resiliency, energy efficiency, conservation, and stormwater management. Uh, and that's a lot. Um, and we're really happy to have Julie here today to present on the Seacoast Transportation Corridor Vulnerability Assessment. So Julie, please unmute yourself and proceed with your presentation. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, this has been an exciting lineup of, of speakers and information. And just to get back to the last question that came up in the, in the question chat about um, giving attention to east-west evacuation quarters in the next in the 10-year plan, we, I will address that as part of my presentation. Um, <clears throat> so I'm here to talk to you about a more, a more local project. So we're going from Greenland ice sheets to national climate assessments to a more local project in the seacoast of New Hampshire. So this is, I'm gonna be talking about the Seacoast Transportation Corridor Vulnerability Assessment um, today, and I'll uh, get into the details. So next slide. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, this project is a truly a partnership between state, municipal, and regional entities. So we have, we have state partners in the New Hampshire Department of Transportation, New Hampshire Department of the New Hampshire DES Coastal Program, and also the University of New Hampshire Researches, which Jennifer um, Jacobs and Joe Sias are our two our two partners from UNH. And then our, our ten, actually there are twelve New, New, New Hampshire coastal municipalities who are, are also our projects. I mean our, our our partners. And just wanted to give a shout out to the funding as far as we're we were funded through NOAA through a 2019 NOAA project of special merit. Uh, merit uh, going out through the New Hampshire uh, New Hampshire Coastal Program. Next slide. <clears throat> so, just giving sort of a regional sort of um, uh, feel to this project. So, the Rockingham Planning Commission has 27 communities in its um, in its planning region, and the population within those communities is roughly a little under 200,000 people. Um, the employment, though, the employment centers, employment um, opportunities are about 120,000. And we start to shrink that down to the 12 coastal communities that were involved in our project, which are the seven coastal community, Atlantic coastal communities. So we're looking from Newcastle, Portsmouth, down to Seabrook. Um, we also included Newington, Greenland, Stratum, Newfield, and Exeter as part of our, um, <clears throat> our assessment region. Part of that reason was for the very question that came up in the, in the chat just recently was that a lot of the east-west um, corridors from Route 1A from the coast, uh, the immediate coast, uh, transcend local roads and state highways into these other four, you know, five communities beyond uh, basically west of I-95. And so those 12 communities um, make up about you know, a little bit less than maybe 40% of the total population in our region and more than half of the employment opportunities in the region. So including all of those communities was super important in looking at our, um, our assessment area. So our assessment area basically looks at, <clears throat> excuse me, I-95 to the west, um, moving you know, east to the Route 1 corridor, and then moving further east to Route 1A, and then including all of the state highways that, that are east-west or connector roads between those three major state highways. Next slide. So the goals of our project were to assess the impacts of sea level rise on um, the transportation, the seacoast transportation network within that geography of those 12 coastal communities. So we looked at <clears throat> um, the one point, one, one point, the one foot, the 1.7, the four, and the 6.3 sea level rise projections to, 20, to 2050. And these were consistent with our tides to storms vulnerability assessment that we completed back in 2014 for the seven Atlantic coastal communities as well as it's, it's, it's consistent with the 2020 science summary that Cameron mentioned that, that Natalie will detail a little bit later in the, in the day. Um, <clears throat> that's, that's, that is consistent within a couple of inches of, of the projections for each, each one of those, those studies, given that the tides to storm study was based on the, 
on the previous um, national climate assessment and the, and the 2020 science summary was based on the, the most recent climate assessment. But it's within the margin of error of mapping within a couple of inches of sea level rise. Um, so our goals were to evaluate changes in traffic volume, traffic patterns, road capacity, and road conditions within the seacoast transportation network, which I'll get into in more detail in the next slides about our traffic model that we used. Um, identifying priority sites for impacting to, impacts to flooding, um, looking at not only um, municipal um, priorities, but also New Hampshire Department of Transportation and regional impact um, sites for priority evaluation. And also uh, looking to our UNH partners to identify adaptation and resilience strategies for these priority sites, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And then we'll talk a little bit about our the Rockingham Planning Commission's um, MPO decision-making process. And MPO stands for Metropolitan Planning Organization, which is part of our, our coordination with federal highways and New Hampshire DOT as a metropolitan planning, planning organization, which requires the RPC to develop 10-year plans and transportation improvement plans, as well as a whole bunch of a whole host of other plans um, as far as being a metropolitan planning organization. Next slide. <clears throat> so as part of the project, we convened a quarter advisory committee um, to really sort of mine the expertise of our municipalities and the folks that, that live and work transportation and, and, and road and roadway network every single day from emergency management directors to police and fire to plant you know planning boards to get their perspectives on what's important to them at a local level um, for each one of the communities and then also we just convened a meeting last week with our dot partners um, to talk about uh, roadway uh, decision making management policies and, and the planning decisions and how we how the dot goes about you know prioritizing you know their their management their management strategies and also where they place investments. Um, we also hope that the, the that assessment will inform state and local hazard mitigation planning efforts, which we we know it we know it we it definitely will be incorporated into incorporated into these plans eventually once the uh, once the the, uh, the assessment is complete. Um, and we hope that it will inform you know more 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 global decisions from the, for the region and about resilience and, and adaptation planning for. Each one of the communities, but also as a at more re, at, on a more regional level, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail. Next slide. <clears throat> so we used um, something kind of con unconventional to, on this project. We used our travel demand model, um, which is a transportation model that we use typically for the purposes of looking at the functional classification, the function, the function of roadway systems. Um, the um, level of service for things like intersections and also for our air quality conformance um, compliance with the with our federal standards. But we had to tweak that model significantly to be able to make it work for a sea level rise scenario um, modeling project. So I'll go into that in a little more detail. But the model uses demographic data um, to evaluate things like uh, population, uh, uh, employment centers, um, um, populations of, of uh, that are that are maybe underserved or at at, at risk. Um, and the model tries to attempts to try and find when you're looking at running the model. If, if a roadway or a bridge or a segment of roadway is closed, where would the traffic go, and how would that impact adjacent roadways? Um, in the model, many roads were included, except for, uh, all the state highways were included in the major connectors to state highways. But some of the local roads, such as small little connectors like the neighborhoods, were not were not included because the model just couldn't take that level of sophistication. Um, and then um, we focused on, on impacts on primary travel corridors. So as part of our prioritization process, which I'll go I'll go through next, um, those primary <clears throat> excuse me primary travel corridors were identified. Next slide. So. Um, our regional travel demand model, it, it, like I said, it includes most state highways and many local roads. And this is sort of a snapshot of the of the planning region for the or the assessment region for the for the project. Um, and these are the roads that were evaluated: red being state highways, yellow being more local roadways. Um, next slide. So, in order to identify um, where 
we, we call water and roads intersect. So where sea level rise in, in inundates ro roadway segments, we start to look at them as, as links. So there were sections of roadway that were so core or segments of, of roadway, like you know, portions of 1A or, or segments that were connected to one another geographically. And we started to look at links, like how could we group these things together so that we could come up with a more functional you know, assessment of whether the roadway was working or not. We could look at one segment of Route 1A, but if a connector road was also impacted, we were sort of missing out, missing out on the detail of, of, of how would someone get from point A to point B to the impacted roadway. So we started to live, move things, you know, uh, create these links and you can see that the numbers, especially this is very telling when we look at sea level rise scenarios on any kind of impact that we evaluate, whether it's natural resources or transportation networks, that once you start getting over the 1.7 foot of sea level rise, the, the amount of impact increases exponentially. When we go to four feet, we see substantially greater impacts in, the, in any system that we look at. Um, next slide. So when we started to tweak the model or our travel demand model, and we started looking at um, what would be the most important things to look at with respect to road closure, we looked at trip generation. So trips from um, residential uses, trips from employment centers, um, trips from emergency service centers like hospitals and, and, and schools and things like that. We looked at trip distribution like so where do these people go when they leave this place where you know what 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 nodes are they actually traveling to and then the mode choice typically it's um mostly relied on on, on vehicles vehicle travel and then trip assignment is basically the model saying um looking at population and demographics and saying where where were these people likely to be traveling to um next slide so we started looking at grouping them, grouping these 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 areas together. There's an inset on the right, which is um it's a it's an inset of Hampton Beach, and it looks at what the 101 intersection with Church Street and Ashworth Avenue at Hampton Beach. And so we started to look at if you look at the blue areas that are colored in this in this slide, um, we started to we grouped these together because otherwise, if we looked at any single uh, segment of blue in isolation, it would not tell a true picture as to what, how the how the transportation system was actually functioning under the sea level level rise scenario. And you can see that pretty clearly from the from the graphic that if you looked at one segment, you would you know you're basically looking at a road to nowhere if you don't look at the entire system um, in its geographic extent. So we started to group them together, and we started whittling things down to um, instead of links, 125 links, looking at 24 links which end up becoming our 24 priority sites that we started to really hone in and look at. Next slide. So again, we started to uh, look at those 24 sites and we started to, to um, score them basically and weight them. And we looked at different, different um, criteria to do that. So we looked at the functional class, classification of the road, um, the average daily volume of traffic, distance to emergency services, alternative route availability, we looked at the social vulnerability index, the SVI, um, distance to community services, and the average land value per acre. And so we came up with basically a score of what we call criticality um, for each one of these 24 segments. How critical was that seg was that segment or that group that group of segments to the overall travel network? Next slide. So that's that was sort of our travel demand model. Um, and I wanted to just jump into a, one slide to talking about our MPO, and then I'm, I'm not going to read all these words. It's just a lot of stuff here, but people can read it on your own. Um, but the Met Metropolitan Planning Organization is, is the purpose is for planning for the long-term needs of the regional transportation system. We do that through long-range planning, through our uh, technical advisory committee, which um, recommends projects to the 10-year plan. We do that through you know, our interactions with our, our partners at the New Hampshire uh, Department of Transportation and the Federal Highways Administration. And um, there's been a huge, and I think Jennifer covered this um, in her slides, that there's been a huge push through Federal Highway Administration in the last few years to plan for more, a re more resilient transportation system. And the, actually, the RPC was part of a Federal Highways Administration case study um, looking at um, our, the way that we've been incorporating climate change and adaptation into our transportation planning and, you know, structures. 
our long range plan or our 10 year plan and others. Um, and so there's been a huge push to look at the MPOs, look, you know, turning towards the MPOs actually from, actually we do Massachusetts and New Hampshire, we had meetings with both of those, um, those groups to talk about how to do this best and share, share information. So this has been, this has been really on the front burner for um, any sort of, you know, MPO planning process that's been moving forward, you know, incorporating this sort of a vulnerability assessment information and long range climate adaptation and resilience planning into our, our planning structures. Next slide. Um, so the outcomes that we, we hope to get out of this project are, you know, a better understanding of, you know, where our transportation network is actually at, at most risk. Um, and to identify those critical links and impacts of closures on the overall transportation network. And I just want to kind of delve, dive a little deeper into this particular bullet point because it goes into that comment that somebody asked before about the east-west highways um, out of the seacoast and they become very critical. And I mentioned before, that's why we included some of the outlying communities that are west of 95 because the east-west corridors off of Route 1A, off of Route 1, and, and, and over 95, which are very limited in New Hampshire, there's only a couple that cross over 95. There's Route 107, there's Route 101, and I, I think that's it until you get to Portsmouth. So, and then there are, are east-west corridors like New Hampshire Route 286 in Seabrook. We go, move north to Route 101 in Hampton. Then we move north, and we then we all then we rely on local railway networks, not state highway networks, to get east-west out of Northampton and Rye and parts of you know southern Portsmouth. So it's really important to look at those east-west east um, highway connections as part of this project, and we are paying close attention to those to those um, those connections and how important they are to the railway network. Um, and so we want to develop more improved concepts and costs, you know, to, to be able to respond to building a more resilient system. And that's where our UNH um, um, partners come into play. We're looking at adaptation and resilience measures that can help to improve the roadway network um, and over time build a more resilient system through more iterative processes. So we see in our, our, our transportation model, if roadways are impacted at the 1.7 foot sea level rise scenario, then it's only going to get worse at four. So the one, these, these what we call outlier, not critical areas, uh, where we see flooding at 1.7 foot of sea level rise are really the places we want to start focusing in on first, because they're the ones that are going to be impacted first, and will only get, like I said, only get, you know, more, you know, more fully impacted as sea level continues to rise. Um, and again, we want to incorporate the, these resiliency factors and these adaptation um, measures into our project selection process, into the 10-year plan, into our long-range you know, planning, uh, planning process. Um, <clears throat> I think I want to go on to the next, uh, the next slide now. So um, this is a snapshot of our uh, of our mapping system that we have. On the left, this is the complete travel demand model network of roads that we look at um, in, in the, on the model. And it's the entire region, so it's the, seven, it's the seven Atlantic coastal communities and the four additional inland coastal communities. And like I said, this doesn't include every single small, you know, railway network. Um, but then on the right, again, this is the, 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 um, the snapshot of the Hampton example that I showed before. And we have uh, web, we call their web maps that are posted on the project website. And the next slide will give you the URL to find those maps, which you can go into this, um, these web maps and turn on the um, different sea level rise scenarios. And you can click on and off the different layers that are um, on it. You can look at travel demand, you can look at population statistics, you can look at um, flooded roadway segments, you can turn things on and off and look at things at your leisure. Um, you can zoom in as we did on the on the, the image on the right to the to the Hampton example, anywhere in this roadway network and look at where the impacts are. So it's a really dynamic um, web-based um, system. Um, and we urge you to like go in and like play with it a little bit. You can't break it. it. Whatever you do on it will not be saved to the network or nothing will happen to it. You can click things at your leisure, 
and zoom in as much as you want, um, but they're they're worth really um, kind of doing a, a deeper dive if you are, especially if you're a municipal representative or whoever you are, if you have any interest of looking where where the um, our impacted links actually are. And typically they are outlined in the blue color, uh, sort of turquoise blue color. And it's really worth going forward and looking at, in more detail at, at the maps themselves because if, if we look at the, the image on the left, this is a pretty daunting image and it doesn't really give you any sort of granularity at all of, of detail. Um, so, you know, really, you know, diving deep into these maps is really kind of a worthwhile activity. Um, so next slide. So the URL at the bottom is where you can find those web maps. Um, they are at the, um, our, the RPC's main website at www.vrpc.org. You can look under the regional community planning link in the, at the, on the top bar, and then go down to the drop down menu to climate change and to the STCVA, which stands for Seacoast Transportation Quarter Vulnerability Assessment Project. And you can find the links to the uh, to the web apps, also to links to the um, to our priority site um, prioritization criteria and, and other documents, including um, some um, recorded videos of our advisory committee meetings that we've had so far. We've had two so far, just one in the last last month or so, and one with our DOT partners just a couple last, last week actually. Uh, and you can find other information about the project there. The project team um, for the RPC is myself as the project manager, Dave Walker, who is our assistant director and transportation program manager, and Kristen Matthews, our transportation GIS analyst. If you have any questions about the map, the maps in detail, I would contact Christian with, with questions. I would contact Dave Walker if you have any questions about our transportation program um, planning process as part of this project. And then any other nuts and bolts, please uh, contact me. We have to answer some questions. So that's it for him. Oh, great job, Julie. Really oh, interesting perfect. stuff. Um, so, um, uh, you know, I wish we could give a round of applause right now, and we'll we'll, we'll wait until we get to the end here. Um, um, do you have a oh, couple? So could of I just ask, could I add one more, just one more thing? I forgot to add. Sure thing. Um, we're sort of in the middle of the process of working with our our UNH partners, Jennifer Jacobs and Josias. To um, we're, what we're looking at is developing uh, a list of candidate sites um, with uh, uh, results from our meeting with the DOT last week. And also looking at ways that we can select sites that cover a range of different adaptation and resilience options. So things that look at things from um, you know, living shorelines to more, more infrastructure related improvements. So um, we are hoping in the next month or so to be able to publish some of those results on, onto the project webpage. So please stay tuned. We're sort of in the middle of our process right now. Um, we'll have, a lot, to, we'll have a, a lot more results in coming forward in the next couple of months. Okay, excellent. Um, so we have one one question I want to uh, we came in to, to start us off, and it's about the the criticality calculations. Um, and it's question is, did you consider to uh, to incorporate an environmental justice lens to determine the vulnerability of marginalized communities that may have less resources to apply to building resilience to help inform your prioritization process? Well, whoever put that in, thanks for asking the question. I, I kind of breezed over that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> the, um, the project selection criteria that was the, the first, we have three different levels going into our selection criteria. So our first core, our first cut of, of selection was just about roadway function. Where, where does the roadway not function at all? Um, and where are the, the weak, weakest links in the transportation corridor? Um, and so then once we whittle it down to those groups that I talked about, to the 24, you know, sort of draft priority sites. We're now looking at those in more detail. And once we select sort of a, um, a smaller list of maybe 10 sites, then we'll go into our second tier of selection or not of evaluation criteria. And for each one of those sites, we'll be looking at um, environmental constraints, environmental impacts such as you know wetland impacts, salt marsh impacts, um, hydrology impacts, um, you know habitat impacts, and things like that. But we couldn't. We didn't really have enough bandwidth in our entire in our project to do all 24 sites. So once we come up with our prioritized list of sites, we'll be going into the deeper dive in the, in the, in the tier two of selection criteria, and then looking at more like marginal populations and other other second tier sort of criteria, looking at what are the impacts if we do any 
to the approaches that we may consider for this particular site. Okay, and that was the question I had, had had is on your on the website um, and you look at the maps, are they just showing the uh, the links uh, that could be affected or did they also show some of the criticality scores? I don't think they show the critical criticality scores. We have a really <laughs> uh, bare of a web of a, um, of a spreadsheet that goes through that. And if anyone's interested, we'd be happy to post that on, you know, post that so that people could take a look at look at it. It's pretty, it's pretty gnarly, you know, spreadsheet. Um, but we could certainly provide that information. Okay, and I think uh, a question just came in that, that may be related, which is someone's asking, is there an email list that we can join to stay in tune with the new data coming out uh, that was mentioned? This basically, is, is there a listserv or something you could they could get on to stay in touch with this project? We don't really have a, a you know like a formal listserv for it. Um, we do have the advisory committee and we have our partners email website. But if anyone would like to email me directly, I would certainly be um, happy to, to to create one and and send out notices when uh, new information is is available and when new um, posts are are happening on the website. But I would just check in. I would say just check in every month, once a month. Uh, looking at the website, I'm sure there'll be new new information posted, um, probably that frequently in the next you know four to six months. Mm -hmm. But if you wanted to email me, I'd be happy to send you a project update. Okay, great. And uh, here's a suggestion that someone's providing about um, an EJ layer, which is contacting the EBC New Hampshire chapter. That's the Environmental Business Council. Um, so that's just a um, you know, I, when I was working in Connecticut, there was specifically designated communities, EJ communities. I don't think that exists in New Hampshire. So perhaps the Environmental Business Council could give you, um, you know, some information on this. Yes, thank you. We are going to amass, be amassing, uh, we are, are already are sort of compiling um, lists of folks that or agencies and groups that can provide EJ sort of uh, data for the more, for the, you know, the, the final priority sites that we're going to be looking at in more detail. Thank you. Okay, so I think we should take a break. But you know, I, I just before we wrap up, I, I thought this was a fascinating presentation, and then really, particularly the the concept of you know I ninety five as an east west barrier. Um, you know, it's something I hadn't thought much about. So I think that's really high level information that's important to understand. So thanks so much, Julie. And I, as I've said with the other presenters, I wish we could give you a thunderous round of applause. Uh, you'll have to accept our. Uh, our web silence as the uh, replacement, but look forward to seeing you in person someday soon. Um, okay, and with that, let's take a short break. Um, uh, le, why don't we return here at um, five minutes after 11? Uh, we'll take a 10 minute break. Um, and I just, uh, if your hands are tired from writing notes, I just want to remind people that in the handout, section of the GoToWebinar, we have uh, the PDFs of all the presentations that were given today that you can uh, view and download. Um, and we also are doing a recording of the presentations so people can listen to this again if they'd like. Um, that recording will have a auto transcript, uh, which we're quite sure will have a number of words in it. We're not sure how good the words will be, especially with all the technical uh, conversation. Uh, but uh, those are two other ways to uh, record this information if you are tired of writing notes. And so with that, let's take a 10 minute break and be back at 11.05.
Okay, it is 11.05 and it is time to restart uh, our training session. I hope everyone had, was able to uh, have a good short break. Sorry, we had to um, reduce the time a little bit there. Just we had some excellent presentations in the morning that I think deserved a few extra minutes for com uh, conversation. Um, so let's get started again. We have two more presentations uh, this morning and uh, we're going to. Um, so it, we might as well get going on them. We have a few minutes at the end for closing comments and adjournment, so we can eat into that a little bit if we need be, if need be, to make up some of this time. So our first presentation today is, uh, or the, is in the second session, is by Natalie Morrison, and Natalie is with the New Hampshire DES Coastal Program, where she serves as the Resilience Project Manager. Natalie will, will provide an overview of the New Hampshire Coastal Flood Risk Summary Part 2, Guidance for Using Scientific Projections. She'll walk us through a step-by-step -step approach to understand and plan for flood risks for transportation projects. So, uh, Stephanie, will you please uh, advance the slides to Natalie's presentation? And Natalie, will you please unmute yourself and begin the presentation? Bill, and good morning, everyone. Uh, while my slides are getting pulled up, um, and at the risk of sounding like a broken record, I just want to remind everyone that the 2019-2020 New Hampshire Coastal Flood Risk Summary is comprised of two parts, including part one, science, which Cameron shared with us earlier this morning, and part two, guidance for using scientific projections, which is the focus of my presentation today. Next slide, please. As you heard before the break, uh, coastal flooding is already a serious problem confronting coastal New Hampshire communities. And unfortunately, things are only expected to get worse in the coming decades. This knowledge ultimately begs the question, what do we do about it? Which is exactly what part two, guidance for using scientific projections seeks to answer. Next slide. The guidance was published by the University of New Hampshire in March of 2020, and as Phil alluded to, it provides guiding principles and a step-by-step -step approach for incorporating the updated projections from Part 1 science into a variety of different private, local, state, and even federal projects, including planning, regulatory, and site-specific efforts. To give you a few examples of how the guidance is intended to be used, a local planning board charged with developing a coastal hazards and adaptation master plan chapter could conceivably use the guidance to determine the appropriate coastal flood risk projections to plan for and to then identify high risk areas where it may make sense to implement a combination of adaptation approaches. That same planning board could also use the guidance to inform changes to local land use regulations to require permit applicants to account for future coastal flood risk conditions. And finally, and perhaps most relevant to today's conversation, the guidance can be used to inform the siting design and construction of site-specific projects taking place in any of New Hampshire's 17 coastal zone communities. And when I say coastal zone communities, I mean the seven communities that directly border the Atlantic Ocean from north to south, as well as the 10 communities that surround the Great Bay Estuary a little bit further inland. I'm going to pause there to give you a disclaimer that Stephanie Giolongo from the DES Wetlands Bureau is going to be giving a presentation during tomorrow's session focused on how aspects of this guidance has been incorporated into the coastal vulnerability assessment requirements in the new wetland rules. So I'm going to avoid talking about that today and I'm instead going to present a general overview of the guidance so that you're equipped with enough background knowledge going into tomorrow's session. Just be aware that uh, some, but not all of the material that I cover today may be relevant for completing a coastal wetlands permit application. Next slide, please. So that all being said, uh, let's start by taking a look at the nine guiding principles, which are listed here and explained in much more detail in the report. 
In general, these guiding principles suggest that decision makers preparing for future flood impacts should support greenhouse gas emissions reductions to avoid worst case coastal flood risk projections, determine tolerance for flood risk, prioritize equity and justice of socially vulnerable populations, protect natural, cultural, and historic resources and public access, act early and incrementally, consider the full suite of adaptation options ranging from taking no action to relocating important assets out of harm's way, adopt flexible strategies, monitor performance, and adjust course as needed and as conditions change, coordinate and collaborate a lot with all relevant stakeholders, and finally, keep in mind the liability of not taking action now that you are equipped with the scientific information that leads us to believe action is needed. These guiding principles are all equally important in my mind, but I wanna take a minute to dig into the second principle in a bit more detail. Next slide, please. So when planning for future coastal flood risks, uh, it's important to note that not all projects require the same standard of preparedness. And so recognizing this, one of the guiding principles presented in the guidance is to determine tolerance for flood risk in order to select the most appropriate coastal flood risk projections to plan for on a case-by-case -case basis. Tolerance for flood risk, which I sometimes refer to as TFR, is defined here as the decision maker's willingness to accept a higher or lower probability of flood impacts based on several characteristics, including things like project value or replacement cost, capacity to adapt, importance for public function or safety, and sensitivity to flooding. In general, the guidance recommends that critical facilities with low or very low tolerance for flood risk, like a wastewater treatment facility or an evacuation route, for example, should plan for higher coastal flood risk projections that are less likely, but that would cause devastating consequences should they occur. Whereas projects with higher tolerance for flood risk, like a walking trail or a shed, for example, can opt to plan for lower coastal flood risk projections that are more likely to occur. Next slide, please. The next section of the guidance lays out what I like to think of as the real meat and potatoes or the step-by-step -step approach for selecting and incorporating the coastal flood risk projections into your decision-making. Steps one and two help decision makers define their planning horizons and determine their tolerance for flood risk. Steps three through six provide specific instructions for selecting and considering the impacts of sea level rise, coastal storms, groundwater rise, precipitation, and freshwater flooding projections based on the project planning horizon and tolerance for flood risk. And then finally, step seven prompts decision makers to evaluate possible adaptation strategies and the potential consequences of those actions, for example, on socially vulnerable populations. I'm now gonna walk you through the seven steps in a bit more detail, and I'm gonna use a site-specific project example to help illustrate how each of these steps might apply. As part of the Seacoast Transportation Corridor Vulnerability Project that Julie just presented on, we've started to conceptually apply the guidance to some of the priority sites. And the preliminary example that I'm gonna share with you today is really for discussion purposes only, and it can likely benefit from some of your insight and expertise. So I invite you to send any suggestions for improvement my way. Next slide, please. Step one prompts decision makers to define their project goal, project type, location, and time frame. For sake of example, I've selected one of the priority sites, again, that has been identified in the Seacoast Transportation Corridor Vulnerability Assessment which includes segments of Ocean Boulevard and Lock Road in Rye, New Hampshire, pictured here on the right of the slide. Our goal for this example priority site is to assess coastal flood risks and evaluate adaptation options. The project area consists of the roadways themselves, as well as supporting transportation infrastructure, including two cement box culverts on Ocean Boulevard and Lock Road, 
and two bridges on Ocean Boulevard. It's also important to note that the roads are surrounded by and sometimes actually bisect the Rye Harbor and Offman salt marsh complexes. For site specific projects like this one, the guidance recommends planning for the end of a project's useful life, which is defined as the full period of time the project is expected to be in service, assuming regular maintenance. So in general, we've estimated the type of transportation infrastructure at the site to have a useful life of approximately 30 years, which means planning for conditions out to 2050. That said, we also think it's important to evaluate this project in the context of the overall transportation corridor, which includes assets that have much longer useful lives. So we can also take a look at what conditions will look like at the site in 2100. Next slide, please. Step two then directs decision makers to determine their tolerance for flood risk, which again from earlier is defined as a decision maker's willingness to accept a higher or lower probability of flood impacts based on project value, capacity to adapt, importance for public function and safety, and sensitivity to flooding. In the case of the Ocean Boulevard Lock Road example, we estimate that the cost of repairing or replacing all of the roads, culverts, and bridges present within the priority site would be very high, relatively speaking, should they be washed out by a storm. We've ranked capacity to adapt as very low, recognizing that it would be hard to maintain access to Rye Harbor if Ocean Boulevard were to be relocated. Similarly, we've ranked importance for public function and safety as high, given the social and cultural importance of and need to access Rye Harbor. And we bring the site sensitivity to flooding as medium, recognizing that portions of the site already flood during coastal storms and astronomical high tide events. So we know that it can withstand some level of flooding. All of these things combined suggest to me that the site has a low tolerance for flood risk. But those of you with more transportation related expertise could make a different determination. Next slide, please. Step three directs decision makers to use the step three table pictured here to select the appropriate relative or local sea level rise estimate to plan for based on the project's time frame and tolerance for flood risk. Sea level rise values provided in this table are lowest for projects with high tolerance for flood risk, shown in the blue column, and highest for projects with very low tolerance for flood risks, shown in the green column. I also want to point out that these colors correspond with the colors of, on the graph that uh, Cameron Wake showed in his presentation earlier. So you can get a sense for what probabilistic estimates we're recommending for use uh, with projects with varying degrees of tolerance for flood risk. In the case of the Ocean Boulevard Lock Road example that we estimate has a useful life out to 2050 and a low tolerance for flood risk, the guidance recommends planning for two feet of sea level rise by 2050. We can also take a look at conditions in 2100 with 5.3 feet of sea level rise. Next slide, please, Steph. The second part of step three directs decision makers to assess how the selected sea level rise estimate affects the project. There are a number of ways and tools available to help do this, but a really simple one is to use the New Hampshire sea level rise mapper that was created as part of the New Hampshire Coastal Flood Risk Summary Update and is available online. Um, and it provides really easy access to future coastal inundation information, kind of a one-stop shop. Pictured on the left here, we have two feet of sea level rise by 2050. And on the right, we have six feet of sea level rise by 2100, which we're using as a proxy for 5.3 feet of sea level rise. Um, just as an aside, the sea level rise mapping layers that we have available are available for one foot, two foot, four foot, eight feet, six feet, and eight feet. So if you find if you select a sea level rise estimate that falls in between there, we generally recommend rounding up as we have done in this case. These maps show the extent and depth of flooding that will occur at least once a day at high tide in the future. 
The lighter shades of blue on both of these maps represent shallower floodwaters and darker shades of blue represent deeper floodwaters. As you can see, Ocean Boulevard and Lock Road remain largely unscathed with two feet of sea level rise by 2050. But the majority of the priority site is underwater at least once a day at high tide with six feet of sea level rise by 2100. Although it's not pictured here, this is also the point in the process where you could evaluate the potential for salt marsh migration at the site as sea level rises. Next slide, please. Step four then walks decision makers through how to account for future coastal storm impacts, recognizing that storm surges are going to be taking place on top of higher sea levels in the future. To do so, I like to start by taking a look at the present day 1% annual chance or 100 year floodplain depicted on flood insurance rate maps or firms, which I have shown here on the slide. From this map, we can see that the majority of Ocean Boulevard and Lock Road sites are located in the floodplain in the AE zone, flood zone, with base flood elevations ranging from 9 to 10 feet NAVD 88. And, and just as a reminder, base flood elevation or BFE is the elevation to which floodwaters are expected to reach during a 1% annual chance or a 100 year storm event. Next slide, please. Next, we can take a look at how the 1% annual chance floodplain may change with two feet of sea level rise by 2050 and six feet of sea level rise by 2100, pictured here on the left and right, respectively. As you can see, the impacts under both of these scenarios are quite staggering. Next slide, please. In order to account for sea level rise adjusted coastal storm impacts, the step four table demonstrates how to calculate a sea level rise adjusted design flood elevation or DFE based on the tolerance for flood risk determined back in step two. In short, the guidance recommends adding selected sea level rise estimates to current base flood elevation and recommended freeboard requirements. In the case of the Ocean Boulevard Lock Road priority site, we know from looking at the 1% annual chance flood maps earlier that most of the site is located in an AE zone with a max base flood elevation of 10 feet NAVD 88. To calculate our sea level rise adjusted DFE or design flood elevation, we're going to reference the equation in the step four table that corresponds with our low tolerance for flood risk. This prompts us to add our sea level rise estimate of two feet to our base flood elevation of 10 feet plus two feet of freeboard, which is required by the town of Rye. Adding everything together, we get a design flood elevation for 2050 of 14 feet NAVD 88. We can also follow the same process to calculate the recommended design flood elevation to account for 5.3 feet of sea level rise by 2100, which is shown on the bottom of the slide. Decision makers could consider elevating the roadways to these design flood elevations if it were deemed critical to keep water off the roads at all times. Next slide. Step five then helps decision makers calculate depth to future groundwater levels. Sea level rise induced groundwater rise has been mapped for some coastal New Hampshire communities like Jennifer mentioned earlier but not all of them. So you'll need to start by consulting the list of communities in the guidance to see if groundwater rise map exists at your project site. Fortunately, maps are available for the town of Rye where the Ocean Boulevard Lock Road site is located. So we can follow the preferred approach highlighted in the step five table pictured here. Next slide, please. To start, the guidance prompts you to refer to the groundwater rise maps on the New Hampshire sea level rise mapper in order to estimate sea level rise induced groundwater rise at the site. On the left, we have projected mean groundwater rise with two feet of sea level rise by 2050. And on the right, we have projected groundwater rise with six feet of sea level rise by 2100. From these maps, we can tell that groundwater is expected to rise 
to varying degrees throughout the Ocean Boulevard Lock Road priority site. So to simplify things, let's take a look at the maximum range of groundwater rise that's expected. On the left, the sage green color in the map shows that the area, area closest to the shoreline is going to experience between 2.2 to 3.2 feet of groundwater rise with two feet of sea level rise by 2050. And on the right, the burnt orange color shows that the area closest to the shoreline will experience between 5.2 to 6.2 feet of groundwater rise with six feet of sea level rise by 2100. Next slide, please. In order to calculate future depth to groundwater, you'll need site-specific data for present-day depth to groundwater. For the sake of this example, let's say that the hypothetical present-day depth to groundwater is five feet. If we subtract the projected ranges of groundwater rise that we got from the maps on the previous slide, we get a 2050 depth to groundwater of 0.8 to 1.8 feet and a 2100 depth to groundwater of negative 2.2 to negative 1.2 feet. These negative values indicate that under 2100 conditions, groundwater is expected to rise above the ground, resulting in land service flooding. Of course, this is just a hypothetical example. And in order to really determine what the true conditions at the site are gonna look like, we would need that present day depth uh, to groundwater information to run this calculation accurately and appropriately. Next slide, please. All right, step six prompts decision makers to account for projected increases in extreme precipitation, again, based on a project's tolerance for flood risk. So in general, the guidance recommends accounting for a 15% increase in extreme precipitation estimates for projects with high to medium tolerance for flood risk and a greater than 15% increase in extreme precipitation estimates for projects with low to very low tolerance for flood risk, like our Ocean Boulevard Lock Road example. Planning projects can account for this in a more qualitative manner, whereas projects involving detailed hydrologic and hydraulic modeling like a culvert replacement, are advised to increase best available precipitation estimates through the Northeast Regional Climate Center or NOAA Atlas 14 by 15% or greater than 15%, depending on the tolerance for flood risk of the project. Next slide. Finally, we've made it to step seven, which decision makers or which guides decision makers as they try to understand cumulative impacts of the four coastal flood risks we looked at in steps three through six. The so step seven table A also describes five types of actions that decision makers sh should consider, including taking no action, avoiding, accommodating, resisting, or relocating. I think Jennifer mentioned these kind of categories of actions in her presentation as well. Um, and depending on the project, decision makers are likely going to employ a combination or multiple types of these kinds of actions over time. So based on our assessment of the Ocean Boulevard Lock Road site, it's likely that a combination of accommodation, resistance, and perhaps even eventual relocation measures are going to be needed to address uh, coastal flood risks in the future. I am by no means a coastal engineer, so I don't really wanna speculate as to what approaches are gonna be most effective at this site, but I have listed a few examples of actions that could conceivably be considered, including things like raising the roadways, changing pavement materials, upsizing the culverts along Ocean Boulevard and Lock Road, implementing natural or nature-based solutions in lieu of conventional coastal protection measures. And then again, perhaps the eventual relocation or decommissioning of some of the transportation infrastructure within the site. Um, the last thing that I kind of want to mention here is that regardless of the adaptation measures that are implemented at this site or any site for that matter, 
it's going to be important for decision makers to coordinate and collaborate a lot with all of the relevant stakeholders. Again, going back to that guiding principle that I mentioned earlier. Certainly, DOTs, MPOs um, are going to want to coordinate resilience planning efforts with municipalities to ensure continued connectivity between state and local roads. We don't want a state road to be elevated without taking into consideration whether a local connector road is going to be elevated as well. Um, it's also going to be important for DOT and municipalities to coordinate with the Wetlands Bureau uh, in conversations like this one to determine what the least impactful alternatives are going to be for particular sites. Um, and also to work with coastal engineers, coastal scientists, and coastal ecologists that have a knowledge of the site's specific processes and habitat characteristics in order to determine the most effective natural or nature-based solutions for a particular site, should those be deemed appropriate. Next slide. So with that, I know that was a lot to digest in a very short amount of time. Um, again, this presentation and today's session is gonna be recorded. So hopefully you'll have a chance to, to go back through if you need some clarification on some of the points that I made. There's also a recording from our um, first webinar trainings that we held back in March 2020 that's available on the DES website. If you search for Coastal Flood Risk Summary, you can find those there. And they go into a little bit more detail about a different kind of example. Um, so with that, I wanna thank you all for your attention and will gladly do my best to answer any of your questions. Um, I provided links to the Coastal Flood Risk Summary Science and Guidance on this slide, along with my contact information. So please don't hesitate to reach out should you need any additional information and assistance in the future. Thanks so much. Well, thank you, Natalie. That was an excellent presentation and a lot of great information. Um, we do have about eight minutes for questions, so and so there's a chance for people to dig in and, and ask questions of Natalie to, to understand this important topic a bit more. Uh, so why don't I, I have one question already, and why don't I start with that and give people other people a chance to uh, uh, start typing in their questions. Uh, so Natalie, here's the question. Regarding site-specific groundwater data for us assessing relative sea level rise induced groundwater rise, should we be looking at actual uh, groundwater, uh, which is subject to seasonal fluctuations, or estimated high water using soil morphology and wetness features, such as uh, redoxomorphic features? That's a good question. Um, Jennifer Jacobs may be able to answer this um, with more clarity than I can, but my understanding is that um, in order to determine present day depth to groundwater, you want to be looking at um, current seasonal high, um, the current seasonal high water table. And so we do have some information available on the DES well um, one stop um, per um, as part of the water well inventory. Um, of course, that would only be helpful if there is a a well that was um, drilled kind of in close proximity to the, the project site in which you're working. Um, otherwise, um, I think there's been guidance provided that suggests you could also do a, a test pit on site to get that information. Right. And I mean, I think it's, it's a complicated question, but probably it gets to your uh, maybe the risk tolerance question. You know, if you're uh, someone who, you know, if you have a low risk tolerance for groundwater flooding or groundwater levels, uh, you might want to use like the, you know, the maximum available or, you know, whatever is the highest of the various ways that you could estimate current groundwater levels. Um, and if you were less risk tolerant, you might use long-term soil profiles or something like that that are more, or soil, prof soil profiles that might be representative of longer term averages. You know, I mean, I think without getting into the details that might be a way of, of thinking about the answer. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Phil. I like that suggestion. Uh, and it gets to a question I had as you were going through, it was just about the groundwater levels. 
and um, because it, in one of the early steps, it was you were looking at the design height for the structure or for the roadway. Um, but then, it, let's say you had needed to maintain some separation uh, between the groundwater and the roadbed uh, for you know longevity of the road. Uh, would you need to um, potentially add to that design height um, based on what your groundwater, um, you know, future groundwater levels might be? in order to have, have the separation from the groundwater in addition to what you would need just to avoid the sea level rise? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point and a great question. Um, the, the sea level rise adjusted um, design flood elevation calculation that's presented in step four doesn't account for any um, groundwater rise influence. And so I think you could evaluate that Kind of confluence as part of step seven where you think about how all of these coastal flood risks interact with one another and make adjustments to your design based on that more cumulative assessment. Um, unfortunately, there's not like a plug and play model out there that's available where you can plug in all of the projections into an equation or something and have it spit out um, the appropriate design flood elevations that factor in all of these different things. So. Um, I definitely think you would have to evaluate the two in concert to one another and, and make adjustments, particularly if you have underground um, infrastructure that, as you said earlier, has a low or, or very low tolerance for, for flood risk. Okay, good. So we have a, a few more minutes here. This is everyone. This is your chance to ask the expert. Um, so hopefully people will take advantage of this. If you have any questions, please type them in. Uh, this is a great opportunity. Um, okay, here's a question. Um, yeah, see, whenever you whenever you say that time's running out, you get questions quickly. Uh, <laughs> all right, here's the first question. Um, might permitting costs be waived for the removal of roadway material? Um, and uh, I guess I'm, I guess the con I'm not sure sure the context of it, but you know, is there um, does that make sense to you, Natalie? Could you give an attempt and answer at that one? I think I'm going to defer to the Wetlands Bureau staff. Um, that's not something that we covered in the development of the guidance, um, but okay. certainly those types of um, those types of incentives could potentially be on the table. But again, that's outside of the the realm of my expertise. Okay. Yeah, and then the the person is saying that the context is overall adaptive resilience. And I agree with you, that's kind of a, a different type of question, perhaps something we can address either offline or in the session tomorrow. Um, next question, uh, in your example, the areas adjacent to the roadways are inundated under both sea level rise scenarios and pre presumably uninhabitable. So what would be the purpose of upgrading, sorry, I have to expand, um, the roadway in infrastructure? That is a, a great question. And I think a perfect example of the challenging conversations that are gonna need to happen when we start thinking about whether and where to invest our limited resources um, in preparing for, for future coastal flood risks. Um, you'll probably get varying perspectives depending on who you ask. Um, and that's another good example of when coordination and collaboration with all relevant stakeholders is really going to be important. Um, you know, depending on what the municipality decides in terms of allowing or prohibiting new or redevelopment um, in that area, you may need to still provide um, transportation access to those homes. Um, or at the very least have a, a conversation about what that's going to look like and how that may change in the future. So um, it's definitely a conversation that I know um, some folks at DOT are starting to have, especially when they think about um, the, uh, the Ocean Boulevard improvement project and the Hampton Seabrook Bridge improvements. Um, I think an important question that's going to be need to ask is, um, at what point do we stop investing? Um, and that needs to be a discussion and a decision made with all relevant parties involved. 
Okay, and great. And uh, Julie LeBranch, who's still on the line, uh, offered a, some a bit of an answer here too, saying that landscape level function may direct where investments are made in the future. Basically, you know, why build if if a road to no one? So I mean, it's all part of that larger planning effort that Julie was presenting on earlier. Uh, another uh, question for you: um, What requirements are required of development design proposals to accommodate the migrations and the limits of salt marsh and/or prime wetlands? So this gets to the salt marsh migration issue. Uh, and um, could you speak to that question? Yeah, I think I'm gonna. I hate to defer, but I, I'd really. I think that's a question that would be. Um, helpful to answer in the context of tomorrow's session, especially when Stephanie presents the um, new coastal vulnerability assessment requirements, and, and maybe she can spend some time responding to that specific question. Okay. All right. We will we'll take that one offline. Um, and uh, another question is, can you um, show again the FEMA floodplain design criteria for a moment? and? Uh, will FEMA readily accept um, the approach that we're uh, presenting in, in the, the seven-step approach? So I guess, Stephanie, could you um, go back to the uh, flood clean design criteria slide? Okay, let's see if I understand the question um, and hopefully um, my response gets at this, but essentially the um, the minimum requirements that are set forth in uh, local floodplain ordinances are, are just that, they're minimum requirements. And so um, this is recommended best practice. Um, and I would imagine that whatever is designed in conjunction with these um, recommended design standards would, would meet the requirements of the National Flood Insurance Program, um, just given that these go above and beyond the minimum requirements that are, that are already set forth in local ordinances. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's probably a good start. I think it's a very complicated question, um, you know, but, you know, I think you're, uh, I think that's probably as good an answer as we can give today. Um, one last question before we let you go and move on to the next presentation. Um, have there been any discussions at the state level uh, to providing new funding sources for these types of projects? Uh, you know, recognizing that these are going to be more costly than uh, you know what we're used to traditionally. Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, there has been little movement at the state level regarding um, state general funds becoming available for this type of work, but one federal program that I want to highlight is the new FEMA Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Funding Program that was um, just launched this year and replaces their um, previous pre-disaster mitigation um, funding grant program. And that BRIC program is really well set up to uh, both do some preliminary planning and design work for transportation infrastructure improvements, as well as to actually um, provide funding for the construction of the improvements itself. So I would definitely um, encourage both the state DOT and um, the municipalities and, and the consultants on the line that work with both of those entities uh, to pursue that funding in the future. Um, there is always the question of match um, with these federal programs. The BRIC program requires a 75 um, federal, 25 non-federal match requirement. And so um, despite our efforts, we weren't able to, to scramble and pull together any proposals for this latest round of funding. Um, but our understanding is that this is going to be an annual opportunity similar to other FEMA programs and that um, if we, we start putting our heads together now, um, we may be able to, to put together some competitive proposals for the next round of funding. 
Okay, that's great. I think we're going to have to leave it there. We've got a couple of the questions that came in that we will defer and try and address tomorrow uh, in more of the permitting uh, discussion. But, you know, Natalie, I want to thank you so much for your extremely uh, informative and really, you know, you know, despite the complexity of the material, a very clear presentation of this step-by-step -step process. So thank you so much. And uh, we'll now move on to the next presentation. Okay, our, our, our last presentation today is um, by Kevin Lucy. Uh, Kevin is with the New Hampshire DES Coastal Program, uh, where he serves as the Habitat Coordinator. And Kevin will be presenting on tidal crossings, assessment implications, and New Hampshire designs. Uh, the goal is to help us understand the latest best practice for assessing and prioritizing road infrastructure that crosses tidal water bodies. Uh, with that, Kevin, please uh, unmute yourself and uh, begin your presentation. All right, good, good morning. Um, so I'm gonna jump right in. Um, So I'm here today to talk about a um, high level overview of the Resilient Tidal Crossings project. Um, we've been at this project for uh, since 2015 our, and are now in our third phase. The first phase was protocol development. The second phase was protocol implementation. And now we're in our uh, third phase, which is to advance high priority projects through uh, design, engineering, and permitting. Uh, this project wouldn't have been possible without a uh, steadfast partnership from the Nature Conservancy and with funding from NOAA's Office of Coastal Management. And just here is an inset map of our locations of tidal crossings in New Hampshire. Next slide. So a tidal culvert for our purposes of this project is a bridge or culvert that conveys uh, two directional tidal flow and or that it's predicted to become tidal with 1.7 feet of sea level rise. Next slide. So the coastal program has been um, interested in tidal crossings for 30 plus years and in a 15 year period in the early 2000s, uh, late 90s, we implemented uh, 15 proactive tidal crossing replacements that restored over 600 acres of salt marsh. Next slide. But as we entered into uh, 2014 and 2015, broader questions were being asked about managing tidal crossings for other things like rising sea level, increasing storm frequency, uh, low-lying infrastructure and operations and maintenance. Uh, next slide. And as you heard from uh, Julie this morning, our road uh, network has been um, shown to be vulnerable um, under sea level rise. And um, so just here with the 1.7 foot of sea level rise, you can see uh, under just the sea level rise scenario, we have six miles of roads impacted. Um, but with a storm surge on top of that, we're at 55. And with greater sea level rise, those impacts um, escalate. Next slide. So in 2015, uh, the Nature Conservancy and DES Coastal Program realized we had mutual interests in, um, in managing tidal crossings. And so uh, with a grant from NOAA's Office of Coastal Management, the Nature Conservancy led a process to convene New Hampshire partners to develop a protocol specific to use in New Hampshire's coastal zone. Next slide. So, um, you know, we've got, we put multiple versions together. We actually had a regional conference in 2015 with participants from Atlantic Canada down to Connecticut. Um, and we put together a, uh, this New Hampshire Tidal Crossing Assessment Protocol and um, subsequently received funding to implement the protocol. And, and thus we were able to convert our um, hard copy uh, protocol assessment to a digital um, uh, platform that is operated through SAIDs on the ArcGIS uh, on, online platform. Uh, next. So the basis of the protocol is this. We have 15 different scores that are uh, based on uh, infrastructure scores, ecological scores, and combined overall scores. So the infrastructure scores look at structure condition and 
certain um, perspectives of inundation risk to the crossing structure and to the roadway. Our ecological scores look at tidal range um, and tidal restriction issues. We look at, at uh, aquatic organism passage. We look at salt marsh migration. And we also do, we did a field evaluation of um, vegetation compatibility. Now the overall combined scores uh, are really mechanisms to help sort and prioritize projects. Next. So we have a five point scoring system where one is generally good and five is generally bad. It's uh, a little too simple to say that a five is bad because it's really about priorities. And so we have some metrics that uh, a five is actually an incentive to do something. So for instance, um, uh, a score of five with high salt marsh migration um, increases the priority of the project. And so three is our break point um, and, and indicates a cause for concern. Next slide, please. All right. So um, we look at, you know, as an environmental scientist, I look at this picture and I see uh, a host of field indicators. Um, for instance, I see low tide water surface elevation. I see salt marsh plain elevations. I see that algae stain on the culvert. I see that rack deposit on the side of the road and I see the road surface elevation. Next slide. So you can see all those indicators that, oh, um, that I just, uh, those are all field indicators that we incorporated into the protocol and thus then um, translated it into scoring criteria. Next slide. So the basis of the protocol was to conduct a relative elevation survey at all of the 118 tidal crossings in New Hampshire. Um, first, we performed a, a longitudinal profile, um, which is an elevation survey of the channel of itself. And so we started at the upstream and we went downstream. We collected distance, height, substrate in the channel, and features such as pools, ripples, culvert inverts, et cetera. Next slide. We also captured the crossing cross section. So we looked at heights along the structure itself and then those field indicators that I mentioned. So most critical here are the, uh, obviously the components of the structure, structure ceiling, structure invert, but we also conducted uh, or captured those environmental field indicators. For instance, the high water rack indicator. So rack is that deposit of grass or seaweed at the high water mark. And we also looked at stain, which is for this project representative of the mean higher high water. Next slide. So we combined those things and, and prepared 118 um, elevation surveys that look something like this. This is Drakeside Road in Hampton. And because we're gonna be looking at a bunch of those, these, I wanted to break these components down. Next slide. So again, we're at uh, the x-axis is distance along the, um, the channel from upstream on the left and downstream on the right. And then we have height and that'd be the 88. Next slide. So here uh, is the channel and you can see uh, depicted here is the channel bottom and the low tide water surface elevation. So at this side of Drakeside Road, you can see that there's a scour pool that's about uh, four feet deep on the downstream side. And you can also see that low tide water surface elevation is different than is, is upstream than it is downstream. Next slide. This represents, this polygon represents the road cross section um, and the yellow dot in the middle represents the elevation of the center line. All this was tied um, to LIDAR by that elevation at the road center line. The red line indicates the high water rack indicator. The turquoise line is the high water stain indicator. And the green line is uh, the salt marsh plain. So as you can see on this example, um, both the red line and the blue lines are higher on the downstream side than they are on the upstream side. Next slide. All right. Um, so what we learned from our stakeholder engagement is that structure condition is obviously going to be the driver of any replacement decision. So we wanted to be sure that we captured uh, multiple indicators of structure condition. Now I'll mention that this is a screening um, protocol and that um, was meant to identify sites in need of further evaluation by structure owners such as DOT or municipality. But bottom line, um, we found that uh, 
you know, 48 structures had multiple indicators of poor condition. Also point out on the coast there near Rye, uh, Rye was the, kind of the epicenter of salt marsh restoration and received multiple new culverts in the 90s and 2000s, which might uh, relate to the good condition of structures in that area. Next slide. So these are our criteria that we use to score structure condition. As you can see, a score of five had multiple indicators of poor condition. And we looked at the wing walls, the head walls, and the overall conduit. And we also looked at indicators of scour. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna focus a lot on um, water level relative to these structures. Some of our, uh, multiple of our measures are focused on that. And so in this example, inundation risk to crossing structure, we look at whether the high water stain indicator is above the culvert ceiling. So this is a close up of the, of the elevation survey I showed you earlier. It's comparing the high water stain or mean higher high water elevation to the culvert ceiling. And in this example, you can see that um, that average higher high tide is above the culvert ceiling. And thereby this structure got um, scores of five, both upstream and down. Next slide, please. So again, here's our, our criteria for this uh, uh, assessment. And you can see that a score of five, again, is mean high water indicator is above the ceiling structure, whereas a score of five, four has uh, at least one foot of freeboard. And a score of one has more than three feet of freeboard. Next slide, please. Here's a visual depiction of um, histogram and uh, where these sites are located. So you can see that this condition of um, the structure being inundated is pretty widespread, but it seems to be worse on the coast. Um, we have uh, you know, almost 40 structures that are currently underwater uh, at a mean high tide. And an additional 22 have uh, less than one foot of freeboard. Next slide, please. So this scatter plot is, is pretty interesting. Um, this, if you read the title, this is a comparison of the mean of all of the sites, all of the 118 sites in New Hampshire, comparing the vertical position of the ceiling relative to the mean higher high water. So where that instance is equal zero, it means that the high water indicator is at the culvert ceiling. Next slide. So um, you can see that if you have a negative number, your high water stain is above your ceiling. And if you have a positive number, um, you have some degree of freeboard. Next slide. The red dot depicted um, below, the below zero negative number is uh, depicted in the right, uh, the photo on the right bottom. That's at Rye Harbor. It shows that it's underwater during a, an average tide. Whereas the green dot with um, the positive number, that's, uh, that's along the Hampton Falls River. And so one interesting exercise we can do is throw our scoring criteria on top of the scatter plot. Next slide, please. Which basically shows the 39 structures that received a score of five, and then just the degree of how closely these structures are actually positioned relative to the mean high water. And then when we think about future conditions and sea level rise and transportation connectivity and resiliency, uh, next slide shows that nearly all of our crossings will be underwater um, during uh, six foot of sea level rise. All right, next slide, please. So this is another metric that looks at, that compares the high water rack indicator to the road center elevation. And this is the same example at Drake Side Road that shows that on the downstream side, uh, the rack indicator is, is pretty close, uh, but it was within one foot of the road surface elevation and on the upstream side, there's a little less buildup. Next slide, please. Here's our criteria for this metric, a score of five, um, means that the rack indicator suggests that the road is inundated, um, whereas a score of four uh, has uh, a distance of approximately 1.5 feet. Next slide. And you can see here's a histogram and a distribution of the, the results showing that, again, this condition of road surface flooding as observed through field indicators is more pronounced on the coast and uh, less pronounced inland at Great Bay. Next slide. 
So we looked at title restriction in four different ways. Um, we developed an overall title restriction score, which is a, basically a derived calculation. Um, but the measured values were the title range ratio in which we evaluated the vertical capacity of a structure by comparing the upstream and downstream title range. We also looked at the crossing ratio, which is comparing the channel width to the structure width. And then we looked at indicators of scour uh, as measured through channel width. Um, and so we have a lot of examples with massive scour pool widths um, upstream and downstream of tidal crossings. I'm just going to focus on two of these, uh, tidal range and the overall restriction score. Next slide. So uh, this histogram and distribution map shows that uh, this is, again, is a comparison of tidal range upstream and downstream of a crossing. And so we have, you know, a distribution of results, um, but five of Five sites show that there is a, a despair, or sorry, 16 sites show that there's a, a, a large disparity in tidal range upstream and downstream sites. Some of these are dams. Um, some of these uh, are just are large tidal restrictions. We also had to define a, a separate category, which was uh, called limited tidal range sites. So these are the sites that are located at the upland edge of a salt marsh or the ones that were predicted to become tidal in the future. Next slide. And then this is the overall title restriction um, score. This was, again, made to sort through these results in order to find the high priority sites. And so here are, you know, you can see the red dots. Those are the seven highest priority are looking solely at title restriction. Next slide. Uh, so that sums up my uh, presentation on the protocol and the results. The results are available in a variety of formats, including um, static reports on DES's website. Um, we also have the, uh, each of the 15 scores uh, available for viewing at the Coastal Viewer. And um, you can actually download the entire data product from SAIDS uh, at, at that URL, which is uh, accessible through ArcGIS online. Next slide. So one of the, I think, excellent outputs of this project is these two-page site summaries. And these provide an evaluation or a summary of all the scores, photos of the sites, the elevation profile. On some sites, we're able to get some narratives. Um, and then we have outputs on structure condition, um, upstream acreage of salt marsh, and certain flood hazard information about emergency access, emergency access and history of flooding. So those are accessible on the Coastal Viewer and in SAIDS and on the static reports. Next slide. Um, all right, so now we're moving into the third phase of the Tidal Crossings project. And um, this, pro this phase is being led by the Nature Conservancy. And they applied for a grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation's National Coastal Resilience Fund in 2017 and received funding to basically develop a pipeline of tidal crossing projects, um, you know, from assessment to design through permitting. Um, and so we went through a process to find those priority sites, work with owners to get those under contract. And we're I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that process. Most recently, DES Coastal Program um, is has uh, been awarded funding from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration under the Project of Special Merit to add an additional $168,000 to, uh, to help advance these projects, but also to collaborate with the Wetlands Bureau to develop permitting guidance for new stream crossing rules relative to tidal crossings. Next slide, please. So the first step in developing and finding these priority projects was to look at our overall scores. And the Nature Conservancy, uh, Pete Steckler in particular, um, pulled out these five high priority sites. Some of you may be familiar with the Lubberland uh, Bay Road crossing site, uh, which got enacted several years ago in which a 36 inch culvert was upgraded to a 16 foot box. Um, so that project is, is now complete. The yellow stars is what we'll be focusing on today. Next slide, please. So this, uh, Natalie spoke uh, at length uh, about this reach along Rye Harbor. 
this was one of the priority sites. Uh, and it's interesting because the longitudinal profile is not always predictive of a site that's you know, not compatible or, or needs attention. For instance, this site was in very poor condition. Um, you can also see how narrow uh, this channel width is relative to the, to the uh, sorry, the crossing width is to the channel width. Um, and if you look at the, the longitudinal profile at the bottom right, you can see that our water indicators are actually below the culvert ceiling. There's no real indication that the road is flooded at this area. And the profile, the channel profile, doesn't really look, you know, ma no massive scour pools. So um, in some respects, this is compatible, except for the structure condition, the channel width. And also there's pretty significant um, salt marsh migration potential upstream of this location. So this project is being, um, this is a DOT owned structure. Um, it, we have a unique setup in which the Nature Conservancy is um, granting funds or providing funds to CMA engineers who is partnered with uh, uh, Dr. Tom Ballastero at Streamworks to uh, design a replacement of the site. Next slide. Here's another high priority site. This one's located in Seabrook. This is a town owned um, site. Here you can see the longitudinal profile is telling us a story about what's going on at this structure. And um, basically you can see that this upstream wetland unit is inundated 100% of the time because the culvert invert is set too high. So there has a permanent ponding condition. Also, you can see the red lines are above the, or at or above the, the road surface elevation. And the photo on the right just indicates, you know, this is a flooding hazard for the town. And this, this road, South Main Street, is often a, um, uh, from what I've heard, a, a secondary emergency egress uh, from east to west from, from the beach. And in addition, uh, next slide. Uh, this site has a lot of uh, salt marsh migration potential. So um, the New Hampshire uh, the Tidal Protocol also has a metric on um, salt marsh migration. And basically, we asked the question, uh, we looked at uh, the sea level rise affecting marshes model. And for all those sites that scored greater than 10 acres of um, salt marsh migration potential, those sites received a score of five. Now, this SLAM scenario that we evaluated was only 1.7 feet of sea level rise. So those mostly activate the sites that are located on the Atlantic coast. If we chose a larger sea level rise scenario, perhaps uh, sites further inland would be higher priority. Um, and next slide. So here you can see um, the South, uh, South Main Street site again. Um, there's 15.2 acres of salt marsh upstream of this site. So we're, the design will be trying to optimize that um, future condition while also solving the existing condition of permanent inundation. Next slide. And one of the other uh, sites, priority sites, there's actually, this one's a twofer. Um, this was, these sites were identified um, for a variety of reasons, but um, in subsequent months, we found that there are high priorities for other reasons. For instance, the project that Julie mentioned this, uh, this morning, uh, the Seacoast Transportation Reliability Project, um, identified this reach um, as depicted in the top left corner as, uh, as a vulnerable link that, um, that becomes inundated with sea level rise. But we're, so while we're also thinking about transportation connectivity, we have to think about habitat continuity over time. You know, we've received the SLAM model predicts that we're going to lose a lot of salt marsh uh, under sea level rise conditions. And by managing these systems at the upland edge, we provide some a degree of assurance that we'll have salt marsh in the future. And I just wanted to point out um, some of this discontinuity uh, that we see in this existing aerial photo, for instance, 113, you can see upstream ponding, um, whereas on 114, you actually have in upstream and downstream tidal flow. Next slide. So these are, uh, these are you know, relatively small structures um, with very limited tidal range. Uh, 114, you can see that the culvert is actually um, you know, an old uh, concrete pipe and uh, the, the channel looks all right, actually, but it could probably be upsized to maximize um, freshwater discharge as well as tidal flooding. 
you know, the site 113 here, um, the pipe is not visible. It's submerged completely underwater. Um, and you can also see the red, uh, the high water rack indicators or the red lines are, um, are indicative of, of road flooding at this site. So um, I'm wrapping my comments a little early here. Um, and, but just to say that we, uh, we have these multiple, we have five projects underway. I just listed four of them. The fifth one is uh, Filbert Pond in Northampton, in which uh, we are working with uh, CMA engineers in the town of Hampton to, and the Department of Transportation to find uh, another, to find a way to ameliorate another perch system. Uh, Filbert Pond is unique in that it has only a six inch tidal range. Um, and so, uh, you know, but the bottom line here is that in order to, I think what we heard this morning is that there's massive need to plan and advance projects to ensure that we have, uh, you know, a reliable transportation system. And the administrative hurdles to advance these projects are, are not insignificant. And to batch projects like this um, are a really good mechanism to kind of scale our approach. So, um, yeah, with that, I'll take any questions. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, the final thought was that um, we do have, uh, in 2019, DES uh, promulgated new rules specific to tidal crossings. In the past um, and prior to this date, we actually had no specific rules for tidal crossing replacement. Um, so uh, Evan Lewis will be talking about this more tomorrow, but the bottom line is that, um, you know, tier four crossings or tidal crossing replacements will be similar to the level of uh, rigor that are necessary for tier three crossings in that you'll need to hi hire uh, an engineer, you'll need to perform hydraulic analysis. The things that are different are there will be different regulatory design criteria. So Evan will go into, into that uh, in more detail tomorrow. All right, and that wraps it. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, super interesting and you know, lots of great work there. Um, so we do have a few questions coming in, um, and I'll start with one uh, that's basically, you know, where you're looking at what are tidal crossings now. Um, do you have a, a way of estimating or do you have a sense of uh, how many crossings that are currently not tidal would become tidal in, let's say, by 2050 or 2020, 2100, I guess? Yeah, I want to say it's about 16 under that 1.7 foot of sea level rise. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these are places that were not tidal now, but will become tidal. And uh, you know, I'm not you know a bridge engineer, so I don't know. Is there a something that affects? Is that uh, affect the considerations for the design or the function of that crossing if when it has a multi-directional flow? Certainly, certainly. Um, uh, very different criteria, and and I think uh, I think that Evan can really capture what, um, what what will need to be captured in permits for that tomorrow. Okay, great. Um, so next question is: um, Are potential salt marsh lands privately owned, and if so, uh, are you you know aware of any resistance from owners to restore them? Uh, in most cases, salt marshes are privately owned, and um, and in each one of these 118 cases will be uh, an evaluation of impacts to private lands. Uh, I didn't mention it, but the New Hampshire Title Protocol does include a metric about um, the number of upstream parcels as a as a surrogate for feasibility. Uh, so fewer parcels, fewer owners, perhaps. Um, uh, higher feasibility. I referenced the Philbrook Pond salt marsh uh, restoration project that has 13 separate private landowners upstream. Um, you know, I think it, it's difficult to get 13 people on the same page, uh, um, but it's just something, you know, like I said, is going to have to be dealt with on a case by case basis. Right, and that gets to one of the questions I had about the the NIFWIF grant uh, for the the five culverts that are the crossings. Is that is the purpose of that grant uh, for just design, or is there any money in it for actual construction? 
the, the grant currently is for design and project development. Mm -hmm. um, the, the supplemental funding from the coastal program and from NOAA is to start regulatory conversations, pre-permitting um, documentation and vulnerability assessments, um, and to begin stakeholder engagement. Right, and a stakeholder engagement might be that working with the private landowners if their, you know, if their property is going to be affected or, uh, you know, if, uh, access is needed. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. A another question: um, Is there any guidance on applying the various sea level rise scenarios for different culverts? Um, for example, depending on the risk factor, uh, the size, roadway class, etc. It, is this getting into what Evan's going to present tomorrow? Well, it's more, it's, I, I was thinking it's more um, what Natalie presented on today is that, you know, different roads might have different um, risk tolerance. Um, and so, for instance, there are some tidal crossings that are private driveways, and those might have a different tolerance than, say, Route 1A's connection to Rye Harbor. And so... Um, I guess I'd point to that, the, uh, the part two of the, um, the guidance to make those decisions. And, and you know, as we're moving these five projects forward, um, these five projects might have different um, assessment and determinations of sea level rise uh, and risk tolerance. Okay, and, and sort of an interesting note about this issue of the private land ownership is um, what is the the, the, sort of the limit of the public trust uh, for tidal waters. Um, so, you know, should sea level rise increase, will be more of the area that's inundated be in public trust and therefore not be privately owned? Um, well, I think it will always remain privately owned. It's just, um, uh, Phil, it's a really good question. I think you've you've honed right in on it. And um, there are cases, uh, Title restoration cases that have gone to court and sided with um, in, in New Hampshire, for instance, um, and have sided with the, the landowner regarding notifications on permitting, et cetera. So it is, um, I'd be actually interested in um, in, in, in more legal uh, scrutiny of that, that concept. Yeah, no, that's an interesting one. Interesting. Um, okay, and then here, here's more, more of a comment versus a question that was. Uh, I think related to the earlier part of your presentation on the uh, parameters that you were looking at for the um, prioritization exercise. Um, and the point, the comment is that it's interesting that many of these parameters are examined by land surveyors when performing coastal boundary surveys or other public trust issues. So there may be, you know, access to more information out there. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, okay, so another question has come in. Um, presumably, restoration of downstream tidal crossings will allow more tidal flow at upstream crossings. Is there a way to account for these potential effects from downstream restoration? So kind of looking at it as a whole system, what you do at one crossing um, you know, changes the conditions at other crossings. Certainly, yeah, certainly. Um, and, you know, I think Rye Harbor is a great example. There are, there are actually relatively few um, examples of inline structures and in, or in series structures in new hampshire rye harbor is one in particular particularly the arm that goes off to the south i think that has uh five five in series five structures in series um you know to to plan something like that um we typically deal with these on a on a as as needed basis but based on poor structure condition generally in the past um but I will say, you know, that in these designs going forward, we're going to be looking to design these as resilient solutions that potentially could be adapted in the future. So, um, you know, I think one of the one of the limiting pieces of information that we have is, well, how high should we set our road elevation at Rye Harbor, and um, and how high of a culvert can we set now? How 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 high of a culvert ceiling can we set? And it's really a chicken and egg situation. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it has some parallels to the tra the transportation network vulnerability assessment that Julie presented on, where um, you're not 
it, you know, it, it's not an individual thing, it's a link, um, you know, and you, you wouldn't want to have one crossing be perfectly sized you know with that with something nearby that isn't and therefore you know the whole uh, hydrologic system is is still out of balance so i mean it's it's kind of thinking about it more in that systems angle you know the other thing i'll say about the the in series structures is often um particularly at rye harbor is that these roads get inundated and the it doesn't matter how much water is going through the structure when the volume of the ocean is going over the road surface and um, so I think I think we'll, particularly on the Atlantic coast we'll always be facing that situation that there's going to be a limit to how large a culvert can be versus how much water actually gets into the upstream system and particularly in Rye Harbor for instance you know when Genesee Beach breaches it actually goes down Route 1A into Rye Harbor so all of these things become flooded and, and really bad conditions. Okay, and uh, here's one last uh, comment was uh, uh, made during your presentation that this the structures that you were looking at weren't designed for uh, pressure flow, and so I mean I think as um, you know as they become submerged and it's you know under higher pressure that may be a problem. Um, okay, well I think we should wrap up. Uh, we're right on time in terms of the presentation. Uh, Kevin, I want to thank you for your informative presentation. Really interesting work, and you know, I think very critical. Uh, from my experience with with funding restoration projects, is the first question is always, do you have a design? You know, do you have an engineered design that is actually ready to go? Um, and funding is much more likely to flow if you've got that design work done. So I think the the work with NIFWIF and TNC will be really helpful in that regard. Thanks. Okay, so we have reached the end of today and I'd just like to take a moment to uh, thank our speakers and also to thank all of you uh, for being with us today. I think it was an incredibly interesting uh, round of presentations and good discussion. Um, I would say from my perspective, the discussion today was both sobering and uplifting. Um, sobering in the fact that the future is now in terms of coastal flood risk. Uh, but I'd say uplifting in that we we also have great tools and great partnerships and great people to adapt. So the challenge is really how to adapt to make our transportation infrastructure more resilient while also protecting wetlands and wildlife. All the while, all while these wetlands are are growing and and shifting uh, due to changes in sea level rise. So. Uh, we hope you'll join us tomorrow because we're going to continue this discussion uh, with a focus on the DES wetland rules. And we've already identified a few synergies between, for example, the wetland stream crossing rules and uh, the um, resilience that that affords for crossings due to extreme precipitation events. Uh, the presentations tomorrow will go further and we'll highlight some of the newer rules uh, related to coastal environments, requirements for vulnerability and functional assessments the compensatory mitigation program, and last but not least, funding opportunities uh, for restoration in the coastal watershed. So as a reminder, just some bookkeeping thing or uh, uh, housekeeping things, uh, the slides from today right now are available um, in the handout section of this GoToWebinar module. Uh, those are just PDFs. Uh, these PDFs, along with a link to the recording, will be posted later on the DES website after they've gone through our uh, compliance review for ADA compliance. Uh, the recording from today will have an auto transcript generated by the software. We can't guarantee that it will be 100% accurate, especially with all the technical terms. Uh, and DES will send out an email to participants when these resources are available on our website. Uh, lastly, I would ask you to take a moment when you exit the meeting to take a few minutes and fill out the survey uh, that, that will pop up on your um, on your window, and it'll help us know what worked from today and what didn't work. And a final thank you to EPA for providing funding for this training. So thanks for everyone for participating, and I hope you all have a great uh, rest of your day.